All right, shall we get started? All right, let's get started. <clears throat> Welcome. Welcome and thank you for coming today. My name is Bernard Harcourt and I'm the director of the Columbia Center for Contemporary Critical Thought. On behalf of the Center, the European Institute, the Maison Française, and the Columbia Global Centers Paris, I'd like to welcome you to this important, I'd say urgently pressing gathering to critically think about the refugee crisis. I'd like to thank Sheila Benhabib for spearheading this effort. Professor Benhabib just returned a few days ago from Athens where she was lecturing on the refugee crisis and she's been the driving force behind this conversation today. So Sheila, thank you. Uh, as you know, the human suffering, the human toil is unimaginable. The numbers are utterly distressing with almost two million migrants arriving in Europe in 2015, over a million of them by sea, almost 4,000 migrants reported to have died trying to cross the Mediterranean in 2015 alone. More than 800 who have died in the Aegean crossing from Turkey to Greece. Asylum claims exceeding 1.3 million in Europe in 2015, all of which challenges the very fabric and politics of the European Union and challenges us all and challenges our political ideals, whether we are liberal thinkers, critical thinkers, or conservatives. It is challenging to us all as humans. We have a packed program today and a remarkable group of thinkers to help us start to the critical conversation today. So let me quickly turn things over to Professor Sheila Benhabib before introducing our distinguished first panel, which includes Professor Saskia Sassen, who has a slight air delay right now, but will be here shortly, Aitan Gundungu, Alexander Alenikov, and Stefanos uh, uh, Gerulanos. Many of you know Professor Sheila Benhabib well, as she has been our senior scholar in residence at the Columbia Center for Contemporary Critical Thought this spring. Uh, when she's not here, uh, she is the Eugene Meyer Professor of Political Science and Philosophy at Yale University, and she's written extensively uh, for years now on issues of migration, citizenship, and human rights, including several books uh, such as The Rights of Others, Aliens, Citizens, and Residents in 2004, Another Cosmopolitanism, Hospitality, Sovereignty, and Democratic Iterations, 2006, Dignity in Adversity, Human Rights in Troubled Times, 2011, and she most recently has edited, together with Judith Resnick, Migrations and Mobilities, Gender, Borders, and Citizenships, Citizenship in 2009. So welcome, Professor Benhabib. Um, thank you, Bernard. It's been a pleasure to be spending my sabbatical semester here at the Center and at the Columbia Law School. A week ago, Friday morning, March the 24th, I returned from Athens where I had been invited for a week under the auspices of the Harvard Business School Club of Greece and Solidarity Now, an NGO sponsored by the Open Society Foundation and its founder, George Soros. Uh, to discuss refugee, asylum, and migration problems within the European Union. Wanting to see the condition of the refugees before I left Athens, we visited the old airport, described as incredibly creepy by a writer online. Elinikon International Airport was opened in 1938, served the German army's needs during the occupation of Greece in World War II, and was closed in 2001 after a new airport was built for the Olympics, which Greece hosted. Today, Elinikon Airport sits abandoned, or it did, until the refugees arrived. We approached the gray, nondescript building at about 10 a.m. They could have been part of a warehouse, a factory, a military base. The first thing I noticed was a young boy of 9 or 10, who together with his father was sweeping the front steps of a room inside the flat building that must have housed them. 
On the other side of the lot were rows of tents of all colors, such as hikers and campers use. Some of the occupants were just waking up. Ahead of us on the balcony of what was once the airport's main terminal building hung a clothesline extending the whole length of the building with multicolored shirts, pants, skirts, and scarves waving in the wind. One could have encountered such a scene of everyday normalcy on any camping site of the world. So why don't I just stop for a second and say hello to Saskia Sassen. Do you want to come to the... It's just three minutes. <laughs> okay. So the deceptive normalcy of life uh, as a refugee. Except, of course, that nothing is normal when you are a refugee. Everyday life that is driven by the needs of the body asserts itself in ways that lets you take nothing for granted. Whether you will wake up in the same room or tent the next morning, whether you will have access to running water and bathrooms, whether there will be a doctor to tend to your wounds or your illness. Suspended between the home that you have lost and the uncertain destination that awaits you, your sense of time is also warped. Should one wake up the children? Do they have to go to school? Ah, yes, but there is no school or playground for them to go to, is there? The seemingly peaceful and quasi-domestic scene that I witnessed at the Elenikon airport is deeply deceptive. Despite the noteworthy efforts of the Greek government and people, and many other civil society groups across Europe, the European Union has failed to deal with the current flood of refugees from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and many African countries in a just and humane way, and not just the European Union. We have failed as well. A continent of respect for human rights and international law is becoming a continent of failed administrative logic, bureaucratic absurdities, and national egotisms, behind which hide right-wing politicians and nativist demagogues. It is surely a supreme irony that the European Union, emerging as it did out of the ashes of the Holocaust, and with the bitter memory of two old wars on the continent behind it, should find itself at the point of unraveling because of the desired entry into Europe of no more than two million Syrians and others. The population of the 28 nations belonging to the EU is approximately 503 million. Surely, no one is being sent to labor or concentration camps today. Yet, the EU is failing to live up to its own human rights commitments by stamping refugees' arms with indelible ink, as it happened in Slovakia, by having them be chased by police dogs and water cannons, as happens in Hungary, as well as in Calais, but above all, by subjecting them to an excruciating limbo about their future lives. According to many estimations, as Bernard mentioned, there are currently 53,000 persons blocked inside Greece. Why blocked? Because the European Union regards Greece as a country of passage, as well as the refugees themselves regard Greece as a country of passage on their way to Germany, Sweden, Austria, or Norway, the strong welfare states of Northern Europe, where they believe their chances for a better life will be more assured than in economically struggling Greece, where in some sectors the unemployment rate, like youth unemployment rate, is 25%. The total number of arrivals in Greece since the migrant crisis uh, started is roughly 1.2 million, and as Bernard mentioned, 4,000 at least have perished in the process of crossing to the Greek Isles. Now, with the closing of the Idomini passage by Macedonia and the closing down of Schengen borders by hun Hungary, Austria, Slovenia, and Slovakia in the first weeks of March, a humanitarian bottleneck has been created. This is not my word. It is the word of EU bureaucracy and newspapers, a humanitarian bottleneck. The estimated 10,000 migrants at Idomini are now being transported back to Greece by buses, 
swelling the ranks of the current refugee population already there. Most likely, these refugees will be returned to Turkey under an agreement concluded between Turkey and the European Union in the summit of March 17th to 19th of this year and now ratified by 28 states. To understand fully this situation, it is necessary to go back to international law concerning the status of refugees as interpreted and executed by the countries of the European Union. The regulation of refugees and asylum seekers who enter the territory of the EU is governed by the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees and its Protocols of 1967. Concluded at the end of World War II, the 1951 Convention defines a refugee, quote, as someone who is unwilling or unable to return, rather unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or opinion, end of quote. The 1967 protocols removed the existing restrictions on the definition of a convention refugee that were confined to the European continent and to events occurring prior to 1951. The Convention and its protocol concretize Article 14 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which recognizes the right of persons to seek asylum from persecution and the right of non-refoulement. The principle of non-refoulement, I quote, is so fundamental that no reservations or derogations may be made to it. It provides that no one shall expel or return refoulé to return a refugee against his or her will in any manner whatsoever to a territory where he or she fears threats to life or freedom. End of quote, Article 14. Add to these regulations one of the most illogical of legal measures adopted by the EU that is responsible for the condition of emergency in countries like Greece and Italy and to a lesser extent uh, Spain. I'm referring to the so-called Dublin Agreement, according to which a refugee's application to the European Union for asylum must be processed, quote-unquote, in the first country of entry. Devised to deal with the phenomenon, again, of refugees in orbit, that is, refugees who submit asylum applications in more than one country of Europe, this agreement has turned countries of the Mediterranean into open-air holding pens. By agreeing to accept refugees carrying Syrian and Iraqi passports as asylum seekers, the German government under Angela Merkel's leadership has in fact abrogated the principle that the first country of entry must be the one in which the asylum application is processed. But if this is so, if the Dublin Agreement has been abrogated, why continue to subject the refugees to tear gas and the police dogs of the Macedonian police as they try to make their way to Germany over land? Why not airlift the refugees? I really cannot say that I understand this legally. I understand it politically. But that may be a matter for a conversation. Unable to face their own demons of racism, Islamophobia, human rights rev violations, and sheer egotism, European leaders have now chosen to conclude an agreement with Turkey. Most likely, this agreement contradicts the 1951 Convention and its 67 Protocol at several levels, but for the moment it is being presented as a deus ex machina to solve Europe's and Greece's problems. According to this agreement, all refugees reaching Greek soil after March 21st will be returned to Turkey via boats and, God help us, aided now by the NATO fleet. The asylum seeker is not only being treated as if he or she were a criminal who needs to be detained and whose movements need to be controlled, but becomes now the enemy who needs accompanying by military force. Turkey has been declared a safe third country and a safe country of passage such as to assuage Europe's bad conscience. But the UNHCR does not agree with the European Union in its assessment of Turkey and Turkey's interpretation of inter international law, 
and is therefore pulling out its personnel from the Greek islands along with organizations such as Médecins Sans Frontières and Save the Children, who are all now abandoning the islands. Currently, now to look at Turkey, there are 3.2 million refugees in Turkey of many more nationalities besides Syrians. About half a million Syrians only are housed in camps along the Syria-Turkish border. The rest of the Syrian refugees prefer to live at large in large in Turkey's big cities. Syrian refugees as a group are not subject to government discrimination or reprisals. In that sense, the principle of non-refoulement is not violated by this agreement. Turkish civil society is also more hospitable to Syrian refugees than countries such as Germany, where refugee shelters have already been subject to racist attacks. However, Turkey is not party to the 1967 protocol, meaning that Turkey only recognizes as a convention refugee those originating from Europe prior to 1951. Now, what does this mean? It means that the status of refugees, asylum seekers, migrants, and displaced persons in Turkey is governed by a directive named Geçici Korutma Yönetmeli, Temporary Protection Directive. This directive is intended as a supplement to the legislation called Foreigners and the Law of International Protection of 2013. All those originating from non-European territories after 1951 come under the uh, administration of this directive. The crucial issue is whether this directive administrative measure is compatible with current standards of refugee protection in theory and practice. Significant NGOs working in this area, as I mentioned, do not think so, though I think it would have been more helpful for the refugees themselves if instead of quitting in protest, the NGOs had remained in Greece and even accompanied refugees to Turkey to assure that procedures and safeguards in their treatment were not violated. The price that Europe has paid for this murky agreement is that for each refugee returned to Turkey from Greece, after March 21st, uh, Europe, but mainly Germany, will accept a Syrian refugee currently in the camps and duly registered with the UNHCR. In other words, there is an exchange process that is going on here, which is quite unusual. Uh, the rest of the refugees need to go back to the end of the line. Those refugees to be relocated to European host countries will presum presumably be flown out of Turkey just as they could have been flown out of Greece into Germany much earlier than why go through the charade. Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has lost no time to parlay this agreement to his own advantage, not only by being promised three billion in refugee aid, but also by asking for the lifting of visa restrictions for Turkish citizens traveling to um, Europe, which is not necessarily a bad thing. And, you know, which, but the same week that the EU-Turkey agreement was announced, the Turkish government shut down the Zaman newspaper and its English edition. The trial of the journalist Jan Dündar, accused of treason for writing a story documenting the transfer of arms through Turkey, possibly into the hands of ISIS, will now be held behind closed doors. Academics and intellectuals who signed a petition to protest the government's treatment of the Kurdish population in the southeast of the country are accused of aiding the terror activities of the PKK. They are now being arrested or dismissed from their teaching and research posts. For the EU to conclude such an agreement with Turkey seems as if, it doesn't seem, is simply turning a blind eye to Turkey's human rights violations and movement toward a presidential dictatorship. So I'm afraid there are no good news at any end of this situation. Let us step back from the real politic which I described, and which is causing as well as defining the parameters of the so-called refugee crisis of our times. I'd like to formulate a series of puzzles, paradoxes, aporias, which may guide our discussion this afternoon. Puzzle number one. In an age where the movement of everything across borders, from capital to fashion, from information to news, from germs to money has intensified, 
human mobility continues to be criminalized. The refugee is increasingly treated not only as an alien body, but as the enemy who is interned in camps, in deportation sites, or in absurd Euro-bureaucratic Euro parlance they are gathered in hotspots. When I first heard this term, I was completely befuddled. Hotspots, to my knowledge, are spots where you can charge your telephone. But this is now the new, the new Euro-speak for uh, the places where they are holding the refugees. And by the way, although this is not our topic, the USA is not an exception to this criminalization of the refugees by any means with its detention centers in Texas and elsewhere for mothers and unaccompanied minors. Puzzle number two. The criminalization of the refugee, the migrant, and the asylum seeker is further indication of the constitutive tension at the heart of liberal democracies between the recognition of universal human rights and the boundedness of the demos. And this paradox produces ever fresher uh, puzzles and contradictions. How can the refugee of today become the recognized asylum seeker of tomorrow and the cohabitant and co-citizen of our own polity do down the line? How do we negotiate this? Is the bounded demos capable of renegotiating and redrawing its own boundaries and understanding of citizenship such as to make aliens and others into citizens. Puzzle number three. The international law instruments of the post-World War II period designed to deal with these issues, the refugee conventions and the 1967 protocol, generate a series of distinctions as between convention refugees and other persons displaced on account of civil war, generalized violence, and natural catastrophes. The convention refugee is closely modeled after the dissident, the prisoner of conscience, the resistance fighter, and of course presupposes the historical memory of World War II in Europe. The convention requires proof of individual persecution, imposing on the receiving states quite a heavy administrative burden of examination. What is the relationship between the individual and the group that is threatened in refugee law? In an age of increased generalized violence, ethnic cleansing, civil wars, and armed confrontations among non-state groups, in what sense is the 1951 convention adequate to deal with the rights of the most vulnerable? And we have a very distinguished legal colleagues here, so I want to plant this on the, on the table. Puzzle number four. The 1951 Refugee Convention does not recognize conditions of extreme poverty and material deprivation as grounds for legitimate refuge. Economic migrants are considered individuals who raise spurious claims to protection and to refuge. But why is extreme poverty and material deprivation itself not a legitimate ground for seeking opportunities to escape from them? Why is the poor African farmer who is facing desertification of his land treated as if he were an ordinary criminal? How sound is this distinction between economic and political refugees? Particularly under conditions of global economic interdependence, when the policies of advanced ed capitalist economies and the damage they cause to the environment have far-reaching consequences, what sense does it make to turn so-called economic migrants away at the door, or better still, douse them with water cannons and police dogs, as happens in Calais? Puzzle number five, and this is my last puzzle. Today, the world migrant population stands at 260 million. It has doubled in 10 years from 154 million in 1990. So it's not the absolute numbers, but the intensification of movement that we should pay attention to. The percentage of migrants to the total world population is not great. It's about 3.2%. But nearly one quarter of the world's migrants are now considered refugees. That is 65 to 67 million at the end of 2015. As the number of refugees worldwide has increased, not only has the number of camps grown, but they have ceased to be places where one held people temporarily, 
Rather, they have become semi-permanent. The largest refugee camp in the world, Kenya as the Adab, is 20 years old and houses 420,000 refugees. The Palestinian refugee camps in southern Lebanon are in many cases nearly 70 to 50 years old, depending on whether the refugee population was created in 1948 or 1968. The refugees who live in these camps, and in some cases who have spent their entire lives there, become PRSs, that is, those in protracted refugee situation. Refugees, SILEs, economic migrants, IDPs, internally displaced persons, PRSs, those in protected refugee situation, stateless persons, are new categories of human beings created by an international state system in turmoil and are subject to a special kind of precarious existence. Although they share with other suffering strangers the status of victimhood and become the object of our compassion, or as the UNHCR puts it, become persons of concern, their plight reveals the most fateful disjunction between so-called human rights, or the rights of man in the older locution, and the rights of the citizen, between the universal claims to human dignity and the specificities of indignity suffered by those who possess only human rights and are thrown outside the bonds of their polity for various reasons. From Hannah Arendt's famous discussion of the right to have rights in the origins of totalitarianism, to Giorgio Agamben's Homo Sacer, to Judith Butler's precarious lives, and Jacques Rancière's call to the enactment of rights, the asylum seeker, the stateless, and the refugee have become metaphors as well as symptoms of a much deeper malaise in the politics of late modernity. What is it about the political architecture and state technologies of late modernity that generate these conundrums? We have organized this symposium with the goal of shedding light on these and I'm sure other questions. And I want to thank all the panelists for their willingness to agree to participate very early this winter at a point when no one could yet foresee how convoluted and intractable the European refugee crisis and also the global refugee crisis would uh, become. Uh, thank you, and now we turn to our first panel. So we have a really distinguished first panel, and I'll introduce each speaker before they speak. They'll be speaking for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll open up the conversation for questions. Uh, we are delighted first to hear from Alexander Alenikov, and we're delighted that he's joined us here at Columbia after serving from 2010 to 2015 as the United Nations Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva, uh, and after serving before that as Dean at Georgetown University Law Center. Professor Alenikov also served as co-chair of the Immigration Task Force for President Obama's transition team, and before that as general counsel and then Executive Associate Commissioner for Programs at the Immigration and Naturalization Service. He's written extensively and thought extensively about issues of immigration, refugee law, citizenship, race, and constitutional law, and we're delighted that he'll be kicking us off this afternoon. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Bernard. Um, so, um, happily, Shayla dealt with a, a number of the legal issues I won't have to touch now, but that'll give me a chance to interact with some of the things you, you've said here. Um, but let me start this way. Uh, look, let's take it as given that nation states need, this is not coming through, the microphone's not working. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay. Let's start with the idea that nation states, states need definition. I don't mean in a grammatical sense, but in a sense of borders uh, and people in a physical sense. Uh, and the usual view, I think, implicit in the notion of uh, nation-state sovereignty uh, is that immigration and citizenship decisions lie at the core of sovereignty because they, in fact, define the people to, who are subject to um, state authority and, in democratic states, able uh, to rule the state. 
Um, it is said that refugees problematize that definition because they present a moral and a legal claim for immediate and indefinite entry into a state. A state is supposed to be able to say who comes in and out if they're going to be a state, but refugees say we need to come in and you have to let us in both for legal reasons and uh, for moral reasons. That's often how it's stated. I think actually that overstates uh, the legal norms, not the moral norms, as Sheila I think is uh, described uh, quite poignantly but the legal norms, because actually the legal norms come down on the side of sovereignty. It's quite interesting that the Convention on the Status of Refugees, the core right there is not a right for someone to enter a country to apply for asylum. It's the right not to be returned where one is persecuted. Now, one might think that that right implies a right to enter, but it doesn't under international law, and it leads to a lot of the conundrums that we will um, be talking about. And in fact, states go further. Not only do they not always let people at the border come in to apply for, for asylum, but many states adopt strategies that prevent people from even getting to the border. So whether these are visa restrictions uh, or interdiction at sea, as was done in the Mediterranean until the European Court of Human Rights said that Italy couldn't do it anymore, uh, or detention just outside the border or at the border, there are lots of strategies for people um, uh, for, uh, for not coming in. So uh, practice and law in the north, in the developed north, favors sovereignty in terms of vis-a-vis uh, -vis refugees. I'll say more about this because in the South there's a very different story and we should not allow what's happening in Europe to, make, to be a picture for refugee protection overall because in fact it's a small part of a much larger system which also needs radical revision but in the South the protection is quite different and quite much better actually than it is uh, in the North. Okay, that's about nation states. So what about supranational organizations? Um, the view seems to be rather strongly that the EU also needs an external border. It needs to define a people. That project is not going particularly well, at least on the defining uh, of, uh, of a people. Uh, and the current situation seems to show how quickly national sovereignty will assert itself over nascent notions of supranational authority as states within the EU, uh, as, uh, as Sheila Dem, uh, described, and uh, just in other parts of Europe, have now drawn lines that were uh, unimaginable just a few years ago in terms of controlling regulation. Um, so, but while the EU hasn't generalized a centralized immigration control, and it hasn't created centralized uh, asylum rules, it has generated legal norms that lay bare a real tension, a real contradiction, which uh, Shayla described, and I'll say a little bit more, um, in the middle of the deal with Turkey, at, at the core of the deal with Turkey, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll come to that. Uh, but first I want to say a bit uh, about the, the headlines one sees that we are witnessing a migrant crisis that, that threatens the, ex the existentially threatens Europe. I, th I think just about every word in that sentence is wrong. Um, maybe even Europe. I don't know. Maybe that's uh, not a word. But certainly, it's not a migrant crisis. This is a refugee crisis. The vast majority of people who flow, cr flow across the borders here are ref people who be qualified as refugees. And I'll come back in a moment to that because actually the broader definition, and I think it was Shale's third or fourth paradox, is actually the working definition for refugee now, even if it's not the convention definition. So this is a refugee crisis. Secondly, it's not clear to me it's a crisis. It may be f refugees flowing over, but the numbers here, as Shayla pointed out, are not extraordinary. Uh, by historical standards, they're certainly not extraordinary for Europe to be able to handle. Lebanon is a country of four million people. It has taken in a million refugees. How can it be that a million refugees in a continent of 500 million people threatens the existence or is a crisis for, uh, uh, for, uh, for Europe? So I don't think Europe is at risk. Um, and in fact, even the idea core to the EU of free movement with Europe, at least for citizens of European states, is not at risk either. Schengen may be in trouble, but maybe people's paper is going to be looked at now in certain places, but uh, there's no challenge here to the free movement of people, citizens of EU states. So I think that this has really gotten spun out of control for lots of other political reasons I think other panelists here, uh, here uh, will talk about. Okay, now for the contradiction in the, in the, Turkish, in the Turkish deal. 
the, the, the purpose for the Turkish deal, is that, as the EU Commission and other policymakers have said, was to break this chain of people coming. And in the view of the government, uh, governments, and this is an argument that we used by the U.S. government in stopping Haitian flows, Australian government in stopping flows uh, to Australia, was done for, it's always put in terms of the safety of the migrants, right? People were dying at sea. They were being taken advantage of by smugglers for $1,000 a piece. They were being sold life preservers that instead of being buoyant actually absorbed water and caused people to drown. So there was a notion of safety. So we had to stop the flow, the claim was, for the safety of the migrants, as well as for other political reasons that we're all well aware of. Um, and the numbers were large. There were 60,000 a month arriving uh, in Europe. What had happened was the original German openness, as you all know the story, stopped and Austria and Hungary and others began to put up walls and this domino effect led eventually Macedonia. You put up a wall and people being uh, uh, trapped in Greece. The, the deal that was reached to stop the flow, as Shayla described, was a direct return for, some, for people arriving and then an agreement for resettlement of people coming back, uh, for some people from uh, Turkey to, to come back uh, to Europe, as well as about six or seven billion uh, dollars uh, and also visa liberalization for uh, uh, so Turks could, uh, Turkish citizens could come to the EU without visas and also movement on Turkish admission to the EU, but I don't think anybody takes that as a very serious part of the deal. The contradiction is the fact that these, as I said, the, the legal norms on human rights, which are quite powerful in Europe and in the EU, make it impossible to have immediate direct return because under the asylum directives, people are entitled to individualized determinations as to whether it is safe for them to return. And under, EU, under European human rights law, blanket or uh, mass expulsions are not permitted. And that was a decision of the court that prevented, that, that struck down a deal between Berlusconi and Gaddafi and when both of them were in power that had taken uh, Italian, uh, Italian Navy directly returned migrants coming from Libya back to Libya. The court said you can't do that without an individualized uh, hearing. So it's clear that you need an individualized hearing. Now this is why the deal says none of these returns will happen without complying with international law and EU law, but once you say that, you won't have direct returns, at least not in a quick way that will show people that it's unsafe to get on boats because there'll be a right to a hearing, there'll be a right to an appeal, not on your asylum claim, but on whether Turkey is a safe place for you to go back to. And, and I'm pretty sure that lawyers are going to find a reason for some of the reasons that Shayla described here for why, for many people, it's not going to be a safe place to return to without dramatic changes uh, in Turkey. For example, Turkey will have to remove the limitation it has. It'll, it'll have to, uh, on, on the convention, so it applies to all people, not just Europeans. It will have to uh, adopt better human rights standards and procedures for testing those uh, and the like. And moreover, Greece itself, even to put this into place, is going to have to dramatically increase its administrative capability. It doesn't have the ability. What Greece was doing in the earlier flows, with people arriving in Greece, and Greece was saying, go ahead, go through, as was Italy. And, uh, uh, be, and, and uh, while the northern parts of Europe were saying, wait a second, the Dublin Convention applies, you're all supposed to go home, Greece and Italy handled that by not registering people or fingerprinting them. So it was impossible to know where they entered. And so there's a fight within the north and the south of Europe here about, about how to handle these asylum seekers. But there weren't, dramatic there weren't dramatic numbers staying in Italy and Greece. They were all moving north. Now they will stay in Greece because they'll be held before they're directly uh, returned. That will increase asylum claims. It'll increase these hearings on safe countries. Greece does not have the administrative capability to do that. The EU promised to send people in. Those people have not arrived. The deal goes into effect in three or four days, four days. Nobody's ready for it. So there will be court cases. This will be stopped. And so this, this contradiction is going to work itself out, I think, in a way of just simply stopping this deal from happening. But what that means then for asylum seekers uh, is very unclear. It may just mean a greater accumulation of people uh, in these camps. And uh, as Shayla mentioned, UNHCR has withdrawn from these camps. I think it's not because they think the deal is illegal, but because they say people are now being detained and, and they don't want to be a part of a detention uh, system. In fact, UNHCR has taken their emblems off the tents. That's how much they don't want to be associated with this. They're, they're removing any, uh, any way to identify, identify them. Okay, so a couple of con uh, conclusions here. Uh, first on the EU side, look, I think there probably does have to be order and control in flows of people across borders. 
I don't think Europe should have an open border with anybody showing up, be able to come in with millions of people. It's not, it actually is not safe travel, and it's not good for the country. But it doesn't mean that orderly procedures can't be put in place to take care of people. I think actually uh, keeping, uh, having people apply from Turkey is not a bad idea. It saves them uh, from the hands of the smugglers and, and from dangerous trips. But for that to occur, you need massive resettlement out of Turkey. And that's what's not happening. So yesterday, in fact, there was a, con a conference in Geneva called by the uh, UN. Ban Ki-moon was there, the High Commissioner for Refugees. They asked all the countries of the world to increase the number of resettlement slots, not just the EU. Very few numbers came forward, which means basically that the four million Syrian refugees in the neighboring countries will stay there unless they take uh, I illegal flights. So the first predicate of a decent uh, a comprehensive plan that will allow people to stay safely in Turkey is not there, which is large resettlement. Secondly, there needs to be much more assistance to the, the hosting states and to refugees themselves because the refugees in these places, um, and, and uh, Shayla mentioned the, the limbo that people live in lives in detention camps in Greece, but this is true of refugees all around the world. Um, these protracted situations exist everywhere. They're not, they're not just in Greek de de detention camps. As she said later, these protracted refugee situations. And people need to be given a right to work to take care of their families. That has to be part of the bargain as well. As, and Turkey has to change its norms for accepting people and protecting them. So one can imagine um, a, a decent system that regulates this flow. And even with that, more people will still come, but th that'll be a manageable number that can be handled through the normal asylum process. Uh, uh, in, in Europe, but, but we are a long way from that, uh, from that happening, which uh, dismays me about actually how the, this current situation is going to play out. But I want, here's my last uh, and broader point. What's happening in the EU is not unprecedented. There are large, have been large flows to the north and to developed states for years. And those states have reacted in the same way the EU did. The EU didn't invent these measures. They, they adopted them from other people. The U.S. interdicted Haitians on the high seas. Now, the U.S. got a Supreme Court decision, unlike the European uh, Court of Human Rights, that said you can take people directly back to Haiti, and they've been doing that ever since. And Cubans were returned to Cuba as well. Um, uh, so, in fact, they had a, a tougher uh, stand on that. Australia, you probably are well aware of what Australia has done with boat people coming into Australia. They were first pushed back, then they were taken to Nauru and, and to Manus Island, and now the deal is that anybody adjudicated a refugee in these distant places will be taken to Cambodia by the Australians, not into Australia, another deterrent measure. At the end of the so-called Vietnamese comprehensive plan of action, thousands of people were pushed back from Hong Kong camps to Vietnam. So, so this, what the EU reaction is, is, not, is not new, it's not unprecedented. I'm not saying any of this is legal, or that it's a good idea, or that norms shouldn't change if it is considered to be legal now. But what I'm saying here, the issue is not, and I'm here I'm speaking from a former uh, UN bureaucrat, I suppose, uh, the problem is really not Europe. The problem is a failed international system pr for protecting refugees. And in fact, the deal that Europe struck, or that Germany really struck on behalf of Europe, which Europe was later forced to adopt, the EU adopted, um, is not the proper deal. It shouldn't be a deal between uh, the EU and Turkey. There should be a comprehensive plan of action for all states of the world. Where is the United States and the Syrian crisis? The United States has promised to take 10,000 Syrian refugees. 10,000. There'll be more than 10,000 Syrian refugees born in these camps in the next year or two. Right? This is nothing. So, the, so what's really lacking is a global effort to deal with this problem. If that were done, if it had been done early, you wouldn't see the mass flows into Europe. This would be controlled and manageable. So I guess that's sort of my, my, my last point here is that this is a system. It can be managed. It can be managed in a way that protects people's rights. It doesn't have to be viewed as a crisis. It's, if it's being called a crisis, it's because of a failed uh, bureaucratic and administrative system or for political reasons. Thank you. So we next turn uh, to Professor Saskia Sassen, who we are uh, delighted to have, I think, on, on, on a trip between the West Coast and Europe. Yeah, so thank right. you for stopping in New over. York. I can't believe it. Um, it's savage. <laughs> it really <laughs> Professor is. Sassen is our own Robert S. Lynn Professor of Sociology and a distinguished member of the Committee on Global Thought here at Columbia University and has written extensively on questions of territory, globalization, and citizenship, citizenship including in books 
such as expulsions, brutality and complexity in the global economy, territory authority rights from medieval to global assemblages. It took me 10 years. 10 years. And uh, a sociology of globalization and cities in a world economy. Thank you very Welcome. much. Welcome. Well, I apologize for arriving late, but the, the flight arrived late. I'm literally on a stopover. It truly is uncivilized, huh? it must be said. Um, so I want to play off two vectors. One is the regime we have been talking about, and I really thought these were extraordinary talks. I just, and, but the other one is kind of a question. Are we seeing emerging a whole set of conditions? And I'm thinking of land grabs, water grabs, climate change. Oh. oh, you heard what I said already, or should I repeat? It's okay, right? Um, so anyhow, UNHCR is an established regime, and I sort of agree a lot with your very practical, almost Dutch practical approach. You know, it, it yeah. could work. I know, but the Dutch are even more practical than the Americans. It's a different kind of practicality. I'm Dutch, so, you know, I see it through those eyes. But, um, but then there is another world that is an emergent world, and it has to do with, I, I think it's in the title of the talk, right? A massive loss of habitat, not due to war. Right now, war is a source of an extraordinary loss of habitat on the part of more and more people. We have 40 countries that have war conflicts, right? This is the highest it has ever been. Refugee, 80 million established, recognized, but there are many more. But I'm interested uh, in another emergent domain. I, re I repeat, you know, land grabs, water grabs, the expansion of mining, just think electronics. Seven new key components that have to be mined. And we know that when a mine has done its job, it leaves behind dead land. Then we have climate change. We have urbanization. We have the making of new cities, the making of office parks. We have a whole set of variables, and it's much longer than what I have just described, that are generating a loss of habitat that is not linked to war. At this point, when a refugee, a recognized refugee, appears in front of border control, or whatever it might be, a court, there is a regime. These other, in quotation marks, refugees, habitat, re loss of habitat refugees, they have to justify their presence, the, whatever their claim is, in terms of their own body, so to say. There is no regime. Now, I, of course, am also bringing in here an environmental dimension. I think it would be great if we could establish regimes to govern some of these extraordinary uh, land grabs and abuses of all kinds of laws. And so that is a bit so what I want to focus on. I, by the way, I have a very long paper that I'm just reading the proofs, which I will be very happy uh, to, to, you know, to put on the right, right. So, so uh, I must say that in my research, I'm not your typical migrant researcher. In, in my research, I've been interested in why migrations begin. Migrations have beginnings. So, for instance, when 20 years ago the sub-Saharan Africans were beginning to arrive in Europe, my question was, why now? What's happening back from where they are coming? So I see, and this is a, a proposition that really has uh, governed my work on migration, I see migrations as happening inside systems. So part of my work, my research has been, what system is it? For instance, I'm doing research now on the Rohingya. You know that that is a whole other major event. Why now? They have been there for a very long time. Why are they now persecuted? 100,000 plus have been expelled. This is Myanmar and Burma, etc. Well, the land grabs that are happening there, the mining developments, they are displacing all kinds of people. And that escapes the war vector, you know, which has a justification, etc., etc. Now, Partly this notion that migration, and I'm using migration in a very broad sense. It could include refugees. I'm not being picky here. So if migrations happen inside systems, then the task really becomes why at some point, especially because for the longest time, this may be changing, I think, now. Most countries have not had emigrations. I have long been in a combat zone with social scientists that trot in very simple variables. I hope I don't offend anybody here, my God. Uh, poverty, 
poverty is not in a country is not enough to explain at least the historic migrations we have had up till now. Most countries have a lot of poverty. Most countries did not have emigrations. So for instance, when the sub-Saharan uh, migrations begin to Europe, about, you know, really it starts 20 years ago a bit, uh, they really, we needed to explain something. You know, they're, they're, so, so to me, this is in a way a partial way of looking at the matter, but it brings in that larger context. And then my assumption is that in focusing on that larger context, we can begin to develop uh, regime. Now, um, so, so I want to, to, the other thing that I'm very interested in is a zone that we might refer as a zone of experimentation with existing regimes. And this is a story that I would say has gone, maybe you are very aware of some of the things I will mention, it has gone sort of beneath the radar screen. Let me mention one example. We all are familiar with the notion of high seas jurisdiction, right? That is the zone where the state can violate its own law, so to say, because you know, it comes out of merchant law, it's an old, old tradition. So at some point, what we saw the Europeans do is try to capture those who were coming in bolts in the high seas jurisdiction zone of the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean might be a small ocean compared to the Atlantic, but it has a high seas jurisdiction because there they could do what? They could avoid violation of non refoulement, right? So they could just ship them back. But they took it further. So that already to me is one of these transversal abuses of an existing regime. So you come out clean as state or whatever, but in fact you have, you know, it's a bit dodgy. But it got even dodgier. And that is that they established high seas jurisdictions inside the major airports, Charles de Gaulle, JFK, London. So that meant basically that they could put them right back onto the plane, so to say. And there were designated zones. You know? So I would sort of sit just to check it out. I travel so much. So what's happening at this airport? And you would see that right before passport controls, where you have to show your passport, there is a little hallway or whatever it might be. And then poof, you know. In the case of JFK, they had quite a detention center attached to it. So now these are just two examples. Some of you may be familiar. They are easy to understand. My question is, what all else is happening besides the totally open and honest abuse of the law, if you want, that we see today in Europe, which is astounding what they're doing, you know, several countries. That is just so in your face that there is no, you know. But I'm interested actually in, in going, digging into the whole matter. Now, um, so then I want to just briefly interrogate, if you want, interpolate. Who's the subject? we're dealing with. You know, we all know by now that many of the Syrians, many of the Afghanis, many of the Iraqis are highly educated people, right? Many of them. And, and so that is a very different subject. And, and we, of course, flatten everybody into a subject that is visible to existing regimes, existing law, etc., etc. What happens when we begin to disassemble that unitary subject? I mean, I think because this is also a risk, you understand, that we are going to have privileged subjects, the highly educated, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that will then enter. And then I worry about those subjects that don't fit, you know, that desirable subject, if you want. And so to me, what is happening right now is so pregnant with potentials to violate existing law and to sort of, you know, get by with murder, so to say. It's already happening. Um, final, final point. It seems to me that one way of thinking about what I'm trying to do in this project <coughs> is that there are all kinds of migrations that are happening, that are old flows, you know, that just goes on. On some level, we might say, that many of these extreme flows that we're seeing, and I'm thinking, I'm looking at three extreme flows. One is the whole European issue, which contains, you know, it's a variable. There is extreme and there is not so extreme in there. The other one is the estimated 100,000, we are not counting the dead, uh, uh, unaccompanied children coming from Guatemala, Honduras, and Salvador. And those children are fleeing urban violence. 
They're scared. Many of them have lost their parents. As you know, Honduras and Salvador are among the most violent countries in the world. Uh, the United States established a regime at some point that, okay, let the Mexicans patrol the border with the southern, its southern border, in the, and that led to even more abuses. These are terrible stories. So I consider that an extreme migration that can get sort of lost in the overall statistics about other more regular migration. So I'm interested in capturing emergent flows, again, because they tell me something has happened to provoke this new emergent flow. The second one, as I already mentioned, is the Rohingya, who, you know, we have had people, just like we saw in the Mediterranean, floating in boats in the Andaman Sea, and, you know, dying, piled upon each other, the countries trying to resist, and there was a great meeting, you, you know, about this, uh, you know, between the key countries involved, you know. So that's an extreme flow that is happening without other flows that get mixed up with the fact that many Thai workers are enslaved by the fishing industry. You know, the fact that Indonesia has how many islands? 15,000. So that quite a few of these un mostly uninhabited, uninhabited islands that are part of Indonesia are now with the Thai fishery industry sort of, you know, takes a rest and, and, and puts its ships. I mean, these are extraordinary sub-histories, you know, micro-histories that are getting shaped in the, in the contemporary moment. And the third one, of course, is the, the European, which is enormously complex. Um, but so the subject that is the immigrant, historically, that's a positive subject in many ways. Historically, the immigrant is a strong subject. Historically, the refugee is a threatened subject. The refugee, after all, leaves because the because of some version of loss of habitat, et cetera, et cetera, right? I think that many of those we call, call migrants today, there is no home to go back. They simply have no home. So I just want to leave you with that final image, you know, this, again, this massive loss of habitat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sassen. Uh, so next, uh, we're delighted to hear from Professor Eitan Gundugdu, who is a professor of political science here at Columbia University and Barnard College. Her writings directly address issues of migration, citizenship, sovereignty, and human rights, and she has recently published a book, Rightlessness in the Age of Rights, Hannah Arendt, and the Contemporary Struggles of Migrants. Professor Gundugdu. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank, first of all, I would like to start by thanking the organizers, especially Professor Sheila Ben-Habib and Bernard Harcourt. I'm very much looking forward to our conversations on this very challenging and difficult topic. The Mediterranean Sea has become a graveyard. We have now normalized the new stories about migrant boat tragedies often accompanied by photos of overcrowded or capsized boats, search and rescue teams, and dead bodies lying on shore or in body bags. These tragedies are often treated as accidents, unfortunate incidents caused by natural forces beyond human control, which makes it impossible to hold any actor or state responsible. But anyone slightly familiar with the border policies of the European states since the late 1990s, and I'm grateful to Professor Banhabi for mentioning the Dublin Agreement here, would be hard-pressed not to recognize that it's precisely these border policies that have pushed migrants to ever more dangerous and lethal journeys in the first place. The predominant narratives centered on terms such as crisis and security, make it impossible for us to recognize these deaths as homicides. The dead migrants become today's hominis sacri, to use Georgia Agamben's terms. They are rendered bare lives who can be killed with impunity and whose death cannot even be commemorated. This problem strikes us powerfully in the aftermath of these so-called accidents. There are no established procedures in place to identify the dead, inform their families, and bury them with proper rituals. The bodies of migrants often cannot be recovered, and in cases of recovery, they remain undocumented and their families are not even notified. In an age obsessed with statistics, the European Union does not even keep an official count of the dead or the missing, which speaks clearly to the dehumanization of migrants in life and in death. 
All we have are the estimates by civil society organizations who have been mobilizing to render these deaths visible, dignified, and grievable. And according to those estimates, migrant deaths hit record numbers in 2015. According to conservative estimates, there were more than 3,700 deaths. And even with these conservative estimates, we are speaking of nothing less than a carnage. The Mediterranean as the graveyard of migrants raises many questions about the key concepts in our political vocabulary. Today I would like to focus on one of those concepts, personhood. Human rights documents repetitively invoke the formulation of the human person, which is a quite peculiar and novel formulation given that it conjoins two terms, human and person, that have remained separate for most of human history. And in doing that, it announces that every human being is to be recognized as a person equal before the law. With this formulation in mind, I would like to ask two questions today. First, to what extent does the existing human rights framework allow migrants to appear as persons equal before the law in life and in death? Second, to what extent can the human rights framework be invoked for the purposes of criticizing the border policies that render migrants non-persons in life and in death. Hannah Arendt's discussion of statelessness in her Origins of Totalitarianism published in 1951 offers an insightful starting point for addressing these questions. According to Arendt, massive scales of statelessness during the first half of 20th century brought to view a troubling paradox. Precisely when one appeared as nothing but human, stripped of all social and political attributes, it proved very difficult to claim and exercise the rights that one was entitled to by virtue of being born human. Arendt took this paradox as a symptom of the perplexities of the rights of man, especially as they were formulated in the 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Rights of man were assumed to be natural rights independent of membership in a political community. They were assumed to belong to man as such. But as can be seen in the title of the 1789 Declaration, this man, who was supposed to be the subject entitled to rights, was also a citizen. The problems with this assumption became dangerously palpable in the early 20th century, when the stateless could no longer rely on citizenship for protections of their rights and found themselves in a condition of rightlessness. When Arendt argues that the stateless people find themselves in a condition of rightlessness, she tries to capture several different dimensions of their predicament. Perhaps the most visible dimension of the problem is the legal one, which consists of the loss of personhood or equal standing before the law. Without any recognition of personhood, the stateless were often subject to lawlessness, arbitrary violence, and police rule. Rightlessness also has a political dimension, as it involves the loss of a political community in which one's action, speech, and opinion could be taken into account. Finally, rightlessness also denotes the predicament of not being recognized as fully human. Isolated in camps from the rest of the world, the stateless were effectively expelled from humanity. I think all of these interrelated dimensions of rightlessness can be helpful in thinking about the contemporary problems today, but I would like to focus on the right to personhood. Given all the developments in the field of human rights since World War II, we would expect the legal dimension of the problem to disappear. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, the human rights framework recognizes every human being as a person before the law. However, you must also note that many fundamental rights have much more tenuous guarantees, especially in the case of migrants subject to detention, deportation, and interception. And these persistent problems urge us to rethink the concept of personhood. Personhood is often taken to be an essential quality inherent in every human being. But we have to understand it, I think, as a legal construct that can be made and unmade, diminished or evaded, to highlight this artificial dimension of personhood, I would like to briefly introduce Arendt's reflections on the etymology of this term. Arendt reminds us that the term person is derived from Latin persona, which denotes the mask ancient actors used to wear in a play. It was Romans who first used persona in, in a metaphorical sense to draw a legal distinction between private individuals and citizens. Romans took personhood as a legal artifact, 
and not as an inherent quality of human beings in their <coughs> natural condition. Making a move that's etymologically suspect, Arendt also tells us that persona comes from personare, which means to sound through. And along with this etymology, she suggests that the mask has a broad opening at the place of the mouth through which the voice of the actor could sound through. Arendt's peculiar etymology of personhood is important for two reasons. First, it draws attention to how rights and subjects of rights are made and unmade by law. If personhood is an artifact and not an inherently given essence, then there is no intrinsic overlap between the human and the person. And this points to the possibility of a gap between the two terms, which suggests the disquieting possibility that not every human being will be automatically recognized as a person. This seems to be a problem, I think, in the case of dead migrants, which I will mention in a minute. And even when one has that formal recognition, it is conceivable that personhood can be taken away. And if it's not completely taken away, it can be undermined or eroded, so much so that some human beings are effectively rendered semi-persons or even non-persons. Second, Arendt's etymology also highlights why the right to personhood is politically significant, especially when it's reconsidered with an attention to the liminal figures inhabiting its borders, including the stateless. To remember the etymology, the artificial mask of persona does not only hide the face, but also allows the voice of the actor to sound through. This formulation suggests that artificial conventions such as legal personhood are crucial for ongoing equalization of human beings, an always incomplete and fragile process, but by no means a negligible one. This point, I think, is quite different from the conclusions of criticisms that renounce human rights and personhood altogether, and without going into the details, I have in mind thinkers such as Giorgio Agamben and Roberto Esposito here. And in, and in insisting on this point, I take my inspiration from Arendt, who ends her radical critique of human rights with their radical reformulation as a right to have rights, a right that she introduces as a condition of all other rights. Taking into account different dimensions of rightlessness, we can suggest that the right to have rights entails not only a right to belong to a political community, but also, relatedly, a right to appear as a person. On the basis of these Orentian reflections on personhood, I would like to re-articulate the questions I posed at the beginning. To what extent do the current formulations of human rights provide migrants with artificial masks that can protect them from the arbitrary violence of states? And to what extent do these masks amplify or silence migrants' claims to equal standing? To address these questions, I would like to turn to a 2012 case from the European Court of Human Rights, and I think this is the case that Professor Alenikov was mentioning, Chrissy Gemma and others v. Italy. The case concerned the interception of three boats that held Somali and Eritrean migrants going from Libya to Italy. The Italian Coast Guard intercepted the ships, forcefully returned the migrants to Tripoli and handed them over to Libyan authorities in accordance with the bilateral agreement that Italy signed with Libya under Colonel Gaddafi. And all of this was done and justified in the name of search and rescue. The court ruled in a unanimous decision that the Italian government violated both the norm against collective expulsion as well as the principle of non refoulement which prohibits states from returning a person to a place where they are likely to be subjected to inhuman or degrading treatment. The case was celebrated as a victory by many human rights advocates who welcomed it as a historic ruling, affirming that the states cannot evade their human rights obligations by pushing migrants beyond the scope of their territorial jurisdiction. I would like to raise some reservations, reservations about that conclusion, however, in light of the Orentian reflections on human rights and personhood. First, in a very troubling move, the court refused legal standing to two migrants who died during the course of the proceedings in unknown circumstances, Muhammad Abukar Muhammad and Hassan Sharif Abirahman. At first sight, this decision seems to be a quite routinized one. The court highlighted that similar decisions had been made in cases where an applicant dies during the course of the proceedings and no heir or close relative wishes to pursue the case. However, from a legal perspective, one does not necessarily lose personhood completely with death. The dead can enter into certain legal relationships, especially when there is evidence that their consent has been obtained before their death. 
In this case, it's important to note that the signatures and fingerprints of these deceased migrants were included along with those of the living on the application. More troubling in this denial of legal standing to the dead, however, is the likelihood that the actions of the Italian state might have directly or indirectly caused their death. In this respect, the case of the deceased applicants should be treated similar to those who have been subjected to enforced disappearance, for example. It would be absurd to suggest that a state can get away with such actions as long as there is no victim remaining alive to testify at the end. What we have as a result is that these two dead migrants are effectively rendered non-persons, deprived of the artificial mask of persona, which also means that their rights claims could not even be heard. In addition to this problem, the ruling emphasized that the jurisdiction of a state is essentially territorial. But in this particular case, the court said, the Italian state effectively had territorial jurisdiction. The ruling was by no means a blanket statement endorsing the reach of human rights to all sorts of extraterritorial immigration control, in other words. In fact, the court, the court emphasized again and again that it was making an exception to the norm of territorial jurisdiction, and that exception has to be decided, it said, according to the merits of each case. This approach, I think, highlights that migrants intercepted in such zones of exception, which Professor Sassan also described, uh, it's not immediately clear in these zones whether a state holds territorial jurisdiction, and the migrants intercepted in these zones have a very precarious personhood. As I use the term precarious, I have in mind its Latin etymology, which basically means obtained by entreaty or prayer, and as such highlights the uncertainty of rights that are dependent on the favors, privileges, and discretions of another person or authority. To the extent that the human rights litigation takes territorial jurisdiction as a norm in the context of international migration, it risks turning the human rights of intercepted migrants into exceptions to be decided in each case. The critical framework I presented so far emphasizes that the universal personhood guaranteed by the existing human rights framework does not resolve the perplexities of the rights of man examined by Hannah Arendt. The gap between man and citizen is bridged in some respects by moving to the concept of the human person, but that bridging, that bridging exposes us to all these liminal figures who are now dwelling in a gap between the human and the person. The perplexities of human rights are not dead ends, however, and they can be navigated in more promising ways, affirming the equal standing of migrants even in the space of a courtroom. And I say even precisely, as, Rod, as Robert Covert reminded us, legal interpretation is different from other fields of interpretation as it works under many constraints and takes place in a field of pain and death. With these remarks in mind and by way of a conclusion, I would like to turn briefly to the concurring opinion prepared in the Hirsi case by the Portuguese judge Paulo Sergio Pinto de Albuquerque. Although it's a concurring opinion, it diverges significantly from the court's problematic reasoning, I think, when it comes to the question of territorial jurisdiction. And perhaps this is not surprising, given that the judge's introductory remarks include a reference to Arendt's notion of the right to have rights. This separate opinion makes several important interventions, and I can mention them during the discussion, but I will only mention now how it challenges conventional understandings of territorial jurisdiction. First, it takes issue with the idea that the sovereign states have a prerogative to control their borders. The court has a tendency to frame the issue as a balancing act between the sovereign right to control borders and the human rights of migrants. Instead, Judge Pinto de Albuquerque's separate opinion reframes immigration control as a primary state function. So it's not a prerogative, but a state function to be always subject to the scrutiny of human rights norms whereas the court's ruling puts the burden on migrants to prove that their case deserves an exception to the norm of territorial sovereignty. The separate opinion turns the argument about immigration controls on its head and shifts the burden to states by requiring them to make sure that their border policies are in compliance with human rights norms. Second, and as a related point, 
The court's ruling in the Hirsi case approaches the extraterritorialization of migration control very narrowly, explicitly stating that the ruling applies only to the specific case of the Italian pushback operation in 2009. It wouldn't automatically apply, for example, to the new surveillance mission carried out now by NATO warships in the Mediterranean as of February 2016. The separate opinion, on the other hand, points to the need to subject all other forms of extraterritorial migration controls to the scrutiny of human rights norms. Included among these are the visa decisions at the embassies, pre-embarkation immigration checks at ports and airports, or provision of funds to outsource migration control to other countries. Such border policies have been considered legitimate forms of state action in accordance with the principle of territorial sovereignty. But going back to the point I made at the outset, these are also the policies that turn migrants into non-persons in life and in death. And there's no possibility of understanding human rights in terms of a right to have rights without interrogating these policies that compound the problem of rightlessness today. When Arendt introduced the notion of a right to have rights, she suggested that it's a right that transcends the present sphere of international law and that it is to be guaranteed by humanity itself. She added, it is by no means certain whether this is possible. As we look at the graveyard that is the Mediterranean, it's impossible not to share that uncertainty today. And I think it's precisely this uncertainty that demands a radical questioning of human rights, one that centers on the figures at the borders of these rights. And that critique should strive to understand not only the limitations and exclusions of human rights, but also the possibilities they might offer for the ongoing inclusion of human beings. Thank you. Thank you, Aiton. So finally, we're delighted to hear from Stefanos Gerulanos, who joins us from NYU, uh, where he's a professor of European history and the director of the Center for International Research in the Humanities and Social Science. Uh, it's with great pleasure that we welcome uh, Professor Gerulanos. He is the author of a remarkable forthcoming book uh, on issues of transparency in French critical thought in the post-war period. Uh, and uh, the title of that, and it's forthcoming at uh, Stanford, is The Matter with Transparency in Post-War France. And he's also the author of An Atheism That Is Not Humanist Emerges in French Thought, as well as co-author of Experimente im Individuum. So, uh, let me give you some space, and, uh, and I'll come back. Well, thank you, Bernard. Does this work? Yeah. Well, thank you, Bernard. How much closer do I need to go? <laughs> so, thank you, Bernard. Um, and thank you, I'm also very grateful for being invited, and that this is not my uh, research subject, not by a long shot. So, I feel quite embarrassed that I'm uh, going to be rather brazenly offering a few thoughts as if they were a complete theoretical assemblage somehow. So I've written them down. I hope you'll excuse me for also proceeding to read. So I wanted to begin with three quotes and then proceed in several directions around the repertoire of concepts that are available for and around the crisis. And the way these concepts, because of largely internal European logics, tend to feed and further this current vicious political cycle with all of its contradi contradictions and all of its results for those desperate outside the walls. The first quote is from Jacques Derrida in his book of hospitality and his arrangement of a principle of hospitality, which in the Western or European sense he would date back to Kant's perpetual peace and defend as essential yet immediately fallible. Quote, this principle of hospitality demands a welcome without reserve and without calculation, an exposure without limit to whomever arrives, yet a cultural linguistic community, a family or nation cannot not suspend or even betray this principle of absolute hospitality to protect a home, to guarantee property and what is proper to itself, uh, but also to attempt to render the welcome effective, determined and complete, concrete. Whence the conditions which transform the gift into a contract, the opening into a policed pact, the rights and the duties, borders and passports and doors, since immigration must, it is said, be controlled. So that's the first one. The second is from Tony Judd's 1995, The Grand Delusion, his critique of the image that the European Union was designing for itself in the 1990s. Schengen's symbolic importance is, he says, quote, the very incarnation of a post-national Europe. In practice, of course, the agreement means something quite different. 
It means that whichever state has the most draconian and exclusive immigration and or labor laws will be able to impose its requirement on all others, a sort of highest common factor of discriminatory political arithmetic. The regulations will be enforced through a continent-wide pooling of data, a kind of interpol for foreigners, refugees, and immigrants, so the policing powers of this multi-state will far exceed those of its constituent parts. This is 95. The object of Schengen is to make Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Croatia, and Slovenia, as well as the Mediterranean Sea, a sort of demographic line, tampon states, that would absorb and block the westward or northward movement of desperate peoples, their own or those to the south and east of them. This casts some doubt upon the plausibility of promises. Now, third, rather than a quote, is a title of a book uh, well known among historians, which, a title which plays itself today much better perhaps than it did when it was first presented as a history of statelessness and uh, asylum seeking, that is um, Michael Maris's title, The Unwanted. And I would like in what follows for that term in its permanence and its harshness, but also in its performance of a desire to resolve an internal hostility, to work as a criterion or a barometer against which we can look at some of the existing and more frequent concepts. This seems to me all the more necessary given the pace of events, statements, the weird temporal cycle of EU meetings to resolve the crisis, triumphant agreements broken a day or two later, the way at any rate that the news filters and produces particular images of the crisis. And as I usually do history of concepts, I'll talk of history of concepts and images. Um, it also seems important because of the readiness with which the concepts available now, she then hence contribute to our existing narratives, usually in their own insufficiency. Um, I should like to note, given that I mentioned the pace, that when you first invited us to speak, the uh, refugee crisis looked entirely different than it looks now, and it's quite probable that by you know, another six weeks from now, we will be talking about something entirely different than we could be doing now. So, first, the distinction of migrant and refugee. The frustration caused by definitions and categorizations in the current discussion is evident, and its capacity to further the refugee crisis into this ever-worsening system is too. As you know, the name refugee crisis wasn't as consistent over the past couple of years, and we could begin with refugee and migrant. British newspapers spearheaded the conceptual confusion, speaking especially of the term migrant crisis at the time, which led to a debate over the particular conceptual status of migrants and refugees that quickly went way beyond the British press and that continues to provide an awkward and largely unhelpful distinction that roughly amounts to economic migrant versus political refugee. This is, of course, a traditional position, but this was the play as it was framed with the, these two terms as the, the limits, let's say. Um, I would like to point that the New Keywords Collective has just published a great dossier of deconstructions of terms like refugee crisis and migrant crisis in the journal Near Futures that's now started by Zone Books. At any rate, the legal discussion that follows from this migrant and refugee operates at one level. A refugee is someone who appeals on the uh, basis of directly political persecution or its possibility. Migrant does not and might be a specifically economic figure or even a clandestine figure. In this regard, it has been common practice and politically ethical to denounce the use of migrant and support instead the insistence on refugee. But refugee poses several problems. First, it abets a historical amnesia vis-a-vis -vis large population movements into Europe in the past 70 years. If we speak in terms of unrecognized statelessness, expulsion, and migration, we might ask for example, was the end of World War II, including the millions of about 10, the movement of about 10 million Volksdeutsche, the last great migration, or is it the one into France from newly independent Algeria, or is it the guest worker migration into West Germany from the 1950s to the 1970s, which came to amount to millions of Turks, Greeks, Italians, and others, and a total of some 7% of the German population, the West German population, or is it the migration from 91 and 95, mostly from the Eastern Bloc, including from East to West Germany, a migration which assembled bit by bit the ta the, 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 what has become a refusal of migration in the past decade. And to give a, a, a rather famous example, which the Poles, for example, have not forgotten, the image uh, in Paris of the sexy Polish plumber who is here to take your job, which was pasted all over walls in 2005, shortly before the French rejection of the European Constitution. Um, Let's not forget the long history of the smuggling of Eastern Europeans into Schengen, as it were, from Macedonia into Greece. Or we could speak of the long-distance travel from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, all the way from 2001 to the present, not to mention the drowning of thousands in the Mediterranean from Italy 
uh, in the Mediterranean from Africa to Italy throughout the last decade. But throughout, migration as such is a matter that has been treated as concerning population control and mass migration into Western Europe, all of it carrying political and stateless dimensions, has been the norm rather than the exception over the past 70 years. Schengen has paradoxically exacerbated rather than resolving, resolved suffering in this because all that presented the numbers from being higher uh, over the past 15 years is the former strength of borders and violent regimes in North Africa and the Middle East. The second is that the contrast of refugee and migrant occludes a lot and the language of law, rights and refugees produces more problems than it resolves. The history of refugees and migrants is a history that has a lot more to do with perceptions and images rather than with um, law alone. Indeed, migration is a matter that Europe during the 1950s through 1970s could be said to have handled in comparatively decent terms, or at least in terms that, make, uh, that from today's basis appear entirely wonderful. In West Germany, as Denise Gertürk uh, David Gramling and Anton Case have highlighted the guest worker program of the 60s and 70s brought about a transcontinental shift of millions of families along with their assets, ideals, institutions, languages, music, and food. Interestingly, as opposed to migrants who were welcomed because they provided a cheap labor force with all of its invisibility um, for a society that was becoming accustomed to luxury in the 60s and 70s, uh, refugees, by contrast, as Judd noted, did not on the whole find regular employment and remained an internal problem. Later internal EU migration, moreover, has been handled within Schengen th in terms that also look uh, from today's, as if, today's perspective as if they were wonderful. But precisely because Schengen in 1985 was modeled on the passage of free goods and a customs union, notably through the Fontainebleau Statement and Saarbrücken Agreement of 1984, it produced precisely the gray zones of immigration that made a black market or trafficking scenario so easy and appealing and desirable while generating a resentment that was previously occluded through the economic rationales of um, migration and immigration. It matters thus a lot to see for the current picture of Germany a good Germany, so to speak, that it has long been a culture cap grappling with migrants, not refugees for the most part, but migrants are not presenting them as refugees, and that within that framework, population movement was largely possible. The terrible paradox is that refugee movement has, by contrast, been highly limited with all that has been said already today. It was already limited in the Cold War as if this principle of hospitality worked so long as the political class did not have to articulate it for itself. Now, the German case was and is somewhat exceptional, but terminological complications are political complications elsewhere as well, and they highlight the political and legal dimension of the refugee while contributing to the gradual rejection of modes of immigration that have operated on economic rationales and that largely worked in earlier decades. In French, refugié is, is a fairly uncommon term these days. It's partly associated in its origins with the Spanish Civil War and also with fugitives from the German-occupied zone to Vichy during World War II. It then became a term for Eastern Europeans uh, during the Cold War, but not, and here the political uh, hierarchy to, and cultural hierarchy continues, but not for those coming to Europe from former French colonies. As for other terms, sans papier belongs really to the past 15 to 20 years. Apatride for stateless is badly dated at this point, and immigré, which exploded in frequency in the 1970s, remains much more frequent and generally acceptable, and it has had mostly a link to the Sahel, indeed. In English, the term stateless, which is so widely used around Durant, with due respect, and which has value for... Um, has value for... Let me see where exactly I was, because there seemed to be a problem. Which has value of... Ah. And which has value today still for its vagueness, has declined nevertheless... Uh, its vagueness as an umbrella term, that is to say, has uh, declined to near academic terms. Uh, as Arendt had asked, and as Mira Siegelberg had written in her history of legal statelessness, um, it remains mostly tied to the terms of the 54 Convention relating to the status of stateless persons and the 61 Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness. But they have not persisted uh, despite the terms academic continuity as an umbrella term. 
In English, moreover, Britain, like the U.S., has been attaching illegal to immigrants or migrants to an extent that taints and effectively denounces the category and its implications. There's a lot to be said against syncopating the migration rationale that worked, so to speak, for a while, at least so that we can recognize the complications that it causes, namely that the image of migration dominates both the discussion of population movement and organizes it, not least given the hostile reception of East Europeans in Western Europe, which they have treated as political, East Europeans have treated as political, and which they are not forgetting now as they proceed to offer the harshest positions regarding immigration, asylum seekers, and refugees. A third point has to do with refugees themselves and the way that they're conceptualized and imagined. By basically being a political victim, the refugee is both de facto and de jure deprived of agency. All the more so in that the case-by-case -case treatment of refugees has pointed in an individual and individual rights direction. Both comparatively speaking and in terms of being reduced to a beggar for rights, the individualized refugee does not provide the best metonymy for the image of destitute groups uh, so easily treated at the national level as exactly unwanted. I'm not saying something that's particularly new. The entire argument on the right to have rights belongs to this disjuncture of agency and the attempt to bridge the abyss. But not only is the language of the refugee falling on deaf ears in most of Europe, it enters into beleaguered media logic that mobilizes a humanitarian empathy for those suffering at the supposed gates with a concurrent invisibility once they have entered the legal system uh, the legal asylum system as supplicants. The refugees' principal pressure point is the appeal for asylum. The need for a return to legalized rights-bearing status uh, subject, but in the media, what works precisely for the contemporary economies of empathy, while at the same time, because of numbers contributing to the extreme rights uh, languages and inundations of the extreme rights, uh, remains a highly problematic situation. The refugee remains in that regard, to use Morris's term, the by now stock figure of the unwanted suppliant, which serves all of these sides of the equation. Whereas legal asylum and that loss of agency produces the necessary economy of empathy confirmation, this deprivation of agency might work better at the smaller scale, but it has been quite catastrophic recently for refugees themselves. Given that public opinion has depended First, on the rhythm of the media. Second, on the persistence of images of destitution. Third, on fatigue with the images of destitution. And fourth, with images easily and directly associated with terrorism. That is, with a refugee being a case-by-case -case concept, by being attached to individuals, the faces of agency-deprived sufferers outside Europe hits up against the surveillance search, search for refugees as agents. In other words, as hostile. The events in Köln on New Year's Eve and after belong to the spectral figure that haunts both migrant and refugee and which played directly on hospitality and violence. But the attacks on Paris in, in Paris in November and Brussels recently dazzled precisely through the recall of a figure that's easily identifiable as an individual agent and which replaces the refugee in the easy perpetuation of particular images. That is to say, very few will need to continue remembering the dead child on uh, the Turkish beach from the summer. Most of you will remember images that appeared over the last two or three months on television in mugshot-worthy mug photographs on the, um, on the news played over and over and over. And if we think of that, then you can, uh, we can ask what others do in the European context. The perversity of the model is that the term refugee by tending toward the singular, by identifying as subjects a group of individuals by way of their lack of agency, finds it all too easy in the public sphere to link refugees, large groups, uh, sorry, to link refugees with agents of violence. And for the extreme right, this has had extraordinary value. Now let me turn quickly to the point on crisis. It remains to be seen whether the situation experienced since last crisis since last crisis, summer can follow the model of a crisis. And I think I, I agree with you on the difficulty of using that term here. At least in the naive sense of crisis as a disruption of the status quo, which leaves open the possibility of a return to the, to the status quo ante. I hope to have made it already clear that migration has been a norm and that the European Union and its predecessors have been fundamentally involved in legitimizing and delegitimizing particular forms of asylum seeking and migration on the basis of easily depoliticizing their reception, but at any rate, without treating them as crises. Now, I don't think that we could simply speak of a crisis 
concerning European sovereignty simply on the basis of the numbers of the last year. Not because this current situation, nor because this current situation belongs also to the lo now long history of decolonization and the yet longer history of empire. To this issue, other forms of what would stand behind crisis might be added. Why didn't France's closure of its Schengen borders with Italy in 2011 to prevent the, um, the flow of Tunisian refugees, uh, why didn't that become a similarly convulsive crisis for the rest of the Schengen, um, uh, of Schengen Europe? If at the time the crisis's name was Lampedusa, why wasn't it really a crisis when mostly Libyan and Sub-Saharan refugees were fleeing to Europe after the beginning of the Arab Spring? Why now? Part of the issue concerns, of course, the usefulness of crisis as a term for dispensing information and also for creating a self-sustaining narrative. The moral economy surrounding empathy requires it, and here numbers and easy images do play a major role that would have been difficult to replicate earlier. But as has been noted time and again, this crisis has become visible precisely because it followed right on the heels, so to speak, of the Greek financial crisis. And it produces a coextensive unit with the Greek crisis, as much as with the, the, the rise of the far right in different countries in Europe and the successes of Erdogan in Turkey. That is to say, the idea of crisis holds the capacity to produce and feed off of an existential image of what used to be called the European project. That term is really quite quiet these days, too. So it seems to me that Derrida had quite the right point in mind when he foregrounded a, a, pr a principle of hospitality, blends with care and empathy on the one order, but fails them at the same time, in the same order. That it needs at once legal and international systems at the same time, and that it, um, so to speak, uh, exhausts itself in the process. I reference that uh, passage on the ambivalence of hospitality because it seems to me to explain particularly well the pendulum between disgust with which we experience Europe's failure and the lack of uh, apparent alternatives, especially now that even the Syriza government has signed on to the program, and the demand for a different, yet nevertheless um, very vague humanitarian language to deal with the, pr to, with the situation. We might say that the crisis also concerns far less the past or the recent present than a sovereignty a question of sovereignty for the future, with the scenes of refugees on the borders and in the so-called hotspots offering a perfect theater for a logic that Europeans have already deployed in the past, but which now appears particularly urgent, especially in the aftermath of the recalibrations of financial control mechanisms in the past year. If this so-called fortress has become financially more rigid and it's ultimately self-destructive logic, and as a result of the Greek crisis forcing um, pushing forward a reorganization that would, that, would, that would supposedly help end the financial effects of the financial crisis since 2008, Europe is clearly hoping that the walls, regardless of their permeability or their actual location, might do the same thing in, particular, in political uh, terms, that it might, they might end or hide the political pressure. So I would like to close in that direction by arguing a particular way in which the refugee crisis refugee crisis, I suppose, inverted commas everywhere, constitutes a central dual theater for European sovereignty, and how this crisis, as crisis, has contributed to the current scenario, has deployed its own logic. One could go about this argument in terms of how, uh, an argument of how it affects sovereignty, in terms of a biopolitics of care for refugees, or of a humanitarian rationale, <coughs> or of a neoliberal biopolitics, but I find the particu the particularly the last term, neoliberal biopolitics, quite unuseful to think of what has been going on in the last while. One also might think of sovereignty by studying all these images that keep recurring, uh, particularly that keep being invoked from the right, uh, that is to say, uh, racial languages of barbarian invasions, foreigners, inundations, and so on and so forth. But one could also look at a different... Um, issue regarding sovereignty. Since the 1990s, and a, particularly, a particular um, image rationale, let's say, since the 1990s, the European Union has presented itself as an effacement of sovereignty within, in which the performance of a, 
rhythmical multilateralism in the service of a European project has taken place through the staging and restaging every other month of official and perfectly boring meetings reported on television toward the end of, general, uh, of, of, of evening news, as well as in newspapers and so on. Since the beginning of the crisis, notably the Greek crisis, the regularity and pattern of this performance has been instead not one of boredom, but one of crisis. Not least given the terrible myopia of some of these meetings, the pressures internal to individual countries away from the meetings, agreements and so on, the kind of instability that follows. In the last year, to complement with that picture, uh, there's a, and this picture of, let's say, a rushed and um, anxious multilateralism, we can put the Islamic State's claims to caliphate-like and quasi-universal sovereignty. It matters to point out that unlike Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State has treated its terrorism less as terrorism per se than as a demonstration of its spectral and ultra-violent uh, presence. It's this bubbling to the surface of a hidden but ever-present and easily demonstrable sovereignty across the theaters beyond its immediate uh, reach. That is to say, uh, in Africa around Boko Haram and also in the European theater. That is to say, the spectacle of sovereignty that they present are these videos of decapitations that are, have generally subsided, but also these attacks and the reporting of them that make clear the availability and the ease of violence and at the same time this constant need for recuperation or a, a narrativization of this, this violence. So just as there is a sort of ISIS shadow territory away from Syria, Iraq, there is similarly this visual performance in Europe. Contrast then the performance of irregular, sudden, momentary, but recurrent violence to the increasingly boring, let's say still, delegitimized, anxious, internally ever divided indecision that concerns decisions around refugees. No surprise then that Europe has also been perfectly comfortable with leaving fairly large populations in these Lyme states at the corners, the tampon states, as he says, uh, at the corners of its, uh, of its space. Why it's so vocally involved in extending and renouncing hospitality, why it needs the concept of refugees, but needs not refugees themselves. It extends hospitality in a demonstration of wealth and power. It refuses it for the same reasons, for its limitations, but also to some degree because the refugee crisis operates as a kind of wedge, a third stage between the upper, let's say, the upstairs discussion in European political performance and these sudden moments of, um, quote-unquote, terrorism, or of terrorism. At that new stage, both hospitality and power take over, with the result that both norms, founded on insufficient and usually rather dated con um, concepts, and... Uh, the people to whom these norms refer to remain trapped and self-destructive into the logic itself. So that unwantedness remains as a core image. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let's try and... Um uh, have some discussion, and we'll try and break. We'll, we will break at three, um, very uh, quickly, just to kick it off. So, um, Alex and Lenikov started us off with a provocative statement, I think, about the fact that we're not in a crisis, which I take it was intended to mean that we should easily be able to deal with two million refugees. It's not so much that there isn't a refugee crisis as that it's not insurmountable. It shouldn't be perceived as something uh, that we can't deal with. Although the provocation does create a certain kind of tension uh, or a, a habituation possibly that takes place, I suppose, when one is High Commissioner of Refugees, that one sees so many of these uh, crises that uh, they no longer take the form of crises or that we become somewhat habituated to them, which I think as critical thinkers we just can't afford. Um, so it also pushes on this dialectic or this tension throughout all of the papers and all of the presentations between the individual, of course, and the structures or the systems. And, and we saw that in uh, Saskia Sassen's turn to uh, the question of systems. What is it that is, uh, how do we understand migration within systems and the loss of habitat? Uh, we see, on the other hand, the individual and the focus on the individual in uh, Ayatin Gundungu's 
emphasis on the burial ground uh, and the single life, right, and the single death uh, that is so important also in uh, Stefanos Gerulanos's push on this tension of individuality and of course on the individual and here uh, the first mention of it of course on the, the threat or the, the image of the individual terrorist which of course plays an enormous role today uh, in these discussions. But it's that tension between individual and structures I suppose, uh, the dialectic between um, uh, rights and obligations or rights and sovereignty or in uh, Sheila Benabib's third question, I think, the relationship between the poverty of the individual and the larger political economy within which uh, migration needs to be understood. So, uh, very quickly, um, returning then to Alex Alenikoff's notion that the law favors sovereignty, and that is a problem, I think, that is at the root of so much of this, uh, the law favors sovereignty. There was uh, one glimmer of hope on, on, that I heard uh, on this panel, and it had something to do with the uh, protection that is done in the South, in contrast to the protection that's done in the North. So maybe I'll just start there by asking uh, Alex Elenikoff to quickly tell us about the difference between the South and the North in the context of protection, uh, whether there's anything to learn there. And then while Alex is talking, let me quickly take a short cue for the few rem remaining minutes. All right, I'll, I'll be very quick. We short time. But first of all, uh, let me say, um, it was a low blow, Bernard, to think that my statement about crisis was a, was a bureaucratic managerial uh, point. <laughs> it was actually, uh, I thought it was a critical point, but it could be that that's my uh, poor way of thinking in, in the sense that, it's, it, that I'm trying to say that there's not a basis for the kind of extreme measures being taken in the name of saving Europe. So it wasn't a fact that these numbers are handled all around the world. It was that we need to be critical of, of the, the political reaction that's occurred because it has been labeled a crisis. But uh, very quickly in the South, um, it, it's, it's a mixed story, but basically people have flowed across borders in the South without limit. 80% uh, of the world's refugees are hosted in developing countries. And so all the crises that have happened in South Sudan, uh, in Mali, in Nigeria, uh, in Central African Republic, in Afghanistan, people have just entered uh, other countries. And, and there, there has been a sense of hospitality in these countries of taking people in. The problem is the long-staying people, the people that were referred to in these protracted refugee situations, because the, 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 the real problem in refugee protection around the world is not the emergency situation. It's the fact that millions of refugees stay refugees forever and that they're in camps or they're denied rights or they're unable to work or they're not in schools and, and you have these lost generations of people, that that is a problem. So there needs to be work in the South, but in terms of border controls, um, people f uh, move across borders uh, in an unimpeded way in, 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 the, in, in the developing world, even though not in, in the developed world. Thank you, Alex. We have a question in the second row. Is um, it on? Go. A, so many questions. I would like to ask one with regard to how law can address those terms of exception. So um, one thing I, I agree with, I think, and Dr. that the Hirsi judgment was maybe in a way a turning point, but it had this downside that it relied on the question whether Italy had actually taken territorial jurisdiction, jurisdiction over the people. So now, right now there's a case pending before the European Court of Human Rights regarding Melia and the border fences. So that seems to be a core issue how the very act of preventing people to enter territory or hindering to even get to the territory uh, can be addressed under the human rights regime. And maybe the second part of the question would be how, what the... Uh, right to asylum under the uh, European Charter of Fundamental Rights can play as well. Um, Professor Lenikov said that under the Refugee Convention there's no actual right to enter the territory, but it seems to be different when we speak of a right to asylum as codified in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Okay. <laughs> Professor Gundugu, would you like to address that maybe? Maybe uh, briefly. It's just basically... Uh, I'd I think her C judgment, her C ruling is uh, important as well. I didn't want to completely dismiss it, but it was very limited in its scope. It basically wanted to remain very narrow and said it was this particular pushback operation. And the downside of that for me was also it, it can be read almost as a guideline for basically states to what do you do to make sure that you actually avoid being put uh, in the court for a violation. 
Um, so uh, it basically said if you don't have this, if you don't have this, then there wouldn't have been actually effective jurisdiction because we understand territorial jurisdiction as the norm and here we are showing that there's an exception on the basis of establishing that it was basically the Italian Coast Guard actually who handed these migrants back to the Libyan authorities. But if you didn't have them, if you had, for instance, private contractors taking care of those, then that raises a completely new uh, question. And now we have NATO warships, and that raises, I think, a whole set of new questions about whether we will be able to see these kinds of uh, cases even. Thank you. Professor Saskia Sassen. Um, so it seems to me that, oh, I'm sorry, that sort of two issues come into the, the picture. One is who is recognized. So coming back to my argument that we have this massive loss of habitat and there are no regimes that govern the subjects and their rights to certain claims if they appear at your border. Secondly, what happens once you are recognized? And this would then limit itself to refugees. You're going to get very different treatments. So my question of this is a sociologist in me rather than the legal scholar, I guess. You know, how do we handle that? And do we need governance elements to address those who have been recognized? What happens then? You know, that is sort of... And now, with this... One more question? Okay. Yes. Yes, thank you. Very briefly to any or all, uh, all of the speakers. Do you really believe that the EU-Turkey treaty is supposed to be implemented? Or is it a, a rhetorical move uh, addressed mostly to national and international uh, publics? The Greek parliament uh, just passed three hours ago uh, an express uh, uh, refugee legislation dictating that any asylum uh, petition should be judged, accepted or denied within 14 days. That seems to be a travesty. Uh, of the law, so who knows. And my second related, and very briefly I will phrase it, question is, it seems that critical scholarship on migration during at least the last two decades has been committed to providing some kind of input to official migration policy. Mm. Migration scholars have been committed to having some kind of impact, some kind of improvement on state and superstate official policies. This seems to have been a failure. Now, bringing an experience from working on the ground to during the last uh, three years, it seems that whereas state policies have been failing, civil society has been uh, taking up initiatives to save people's lives. And my question, and so it's not a rhetorical question, it's a true question, is should some part of the uh, critical migration scholarship being addressed to provide new ideas and new input addressed to civil society as how to react. People, for example, refugees in Greece have survived the last two years because of simple and common people's actions. So could we, as critical migration scholars, provide some kind of input to these people? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, this is good. Yes, yes, and no, huh, to your, if anybody remembers. But that's my short answer. But, you know, I think that... That I'm not sure if it is true that the, the, the scholars on migration have basically provided, you know, but I can see that that could happen, and it's a very interesting observation. I hadn't quite heard that. Now, it seems to me that, that we really need to recognize a whole variety, I come back to my, my key subject here, we need to recognize a whole variety of conditions. We need to broaden the spectrum and to recognize, you know, that there are several other issues, and we need to construct new rights-bearing subjects. I think that becomes extremely important. On Turkey, that's a very good point you make, and that's a very ambiguous zone, conceptually speaking. Let's remember that Erdogan says, we will build a city for refugees. In other words, you know, the construction company is one of the leading sectors in the Turkish economy. They are global. So, yes, bring me all those refugees. There are multiple interests that come together, that were then dressed in the clothing, you know, of a refugee, very problematic, but not, perhaps not more problematic than some of the stuff that is happening inside Europe, you know, building walls and all of that. I really have to apologize. Okay. So, um, Saskia Sassen has to catch the next plane. So, um, she's going to take off. And maybe this will be a good spot for us to take a small pause, thank our speakers. <laughs>
So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to take a small 10-minute break. If you, uh, we, and we'll, we'd love to see you back for the second panel. If you need to leave for the second panel and won't be here, please clear your seat and the garbage that we know that there's an empty seat because we have a waiting list. And if you are staying, leave a coat or something on your chair. All right, and see you at 310. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Let's uh, get started with the uh, second uh, panel of uh, what has been also so far a really instructive and fascinating uh, discussion. We have named uh, this uh, second panel the dystopia of the right to movement. Uh, if uh, human rights mean anything, they certainly do mean also the capacity of human beings to move, whether across borders or within borders, but uh, human beings have legs, only trees have roots. Uh, uh, we need to remind ourselves, and migrations have been a ubiquitous feature of human history and culture for many, many centuries since the beginning of Homo sapiens. And maybe what we have learned is that the language of crisis is of recent doing and perhaps just reflects uh, the uh, kind of paradoxical nature of the interstate regulations in the post-World War II period as it also pertains to human uh, mobility. Uh, we will follow a slightly different sequence in this panel. I will introduce everybody and then I'll go and uh, sit down rather than introducing our speakers individually. Our first speaker on this panel will be Daniel Kanström, who is Professor of Law and Thomas Kearney, Distinguished Professor at Boston College Law School where he teaches immigration and refugee law, international human rights law, constitutional law, and administrative law. He is the director of the International Human Rights Program and co-founder of the Post-Deportation Human Rights Project, which uh, seeks to address the question of, the much de neglected question of deportees and uh, deportation. He founded the Boston College Immigration and Asylum uh, Clinic and has uh, worked uh, with uh, his uh, students on the rights of refugees, deportees, and asylum seekers. Um, I have now misplaced uh, the page containing your publications, Daniel, for just uh, one second for uh, give me or... I wrote the origins of totalitarianism. <laughs> <laughs> That's very sweet. <laughs> In German. <laughs> In German. <laughs> Maybe you will. Thank you, uh, and Bernard, to the to the rescue uh, here. And I do um, I do uh, apologize. He's the author of Aftermath: uh, Deportation Law and the New American Diaspora, uh, 2012, and Deportation Nation: Outsiders in American History, 2007. His most recent edited book with psychologist Brinton Likes is called The New Deportations Delirium Interdisciplinary um, Responses. He was a member of the National Immigration Commission of the American Bar Association. Um, uh, following Daniel uh, will be uh, Turkular Ushiksel from Columbia University, who has recently been named James P. Shenton, assistant professor in the core curriculum. She earned her PhD in political science from Yale University and works primarily in contemporary uh, theory. Uh, Turku has been a Perkins Fellow at Princeton University's program in law and public affairs and Emile Neoil Fellow at Jean Murray uh, Center and holds many other fellowships. But last but not least, her very important book, uh, a Theory of Constitutionalism Beyond the State is forthcoming from Oxford University Press very soon. So we even have a uh, copy today. Our uh, third uh, speaker, also very well known to many of you here, is Status Gregoris, who uh, writes on a variety of uh, subjects, 
around questions of the intertwinement of poetics and politics in modernity and democracy. He's the author of Dream Nation, Enlightenment, Colonization, and the Institution of Modern Greece, um, that, an older book from 1996. Does literature think? Literature as theory of the anti-mythical era, 20, um, 2003, Lessons in Secular Criticism, 2013, and editor of Freud and Fundamentalism, uh, The Psychical Politics of Knowledge. Outside of these projects, uh, studies has also published on ancient Greek philosophy, modern poetics, film, contemporary music, uh, and psychoanalysis, He's the Greek equivalent of the Renaissance man, from what I can. <laughs> but I'm sure there is a good phrase. <laughs> there is a good phrase in Greek uh, for it. Uh, lastly, uh, my one-time colleague from Yale, whom you stole, Professor Adam Tees, uh, Adam Tees, who teaches uh, in the fields of 20th century contemporary history at, at Columbia University. And he is the author of a really distinguished and wonderful uh, recent uh, book, uh, The Deluge, The Great War, and the Remaking of the Global Order, 1916-1931. He's currently completing a new global history of the great financial crisis in 2007 and after. So we're giving each speaker no more than 20 minutes and so as to be able to open up to discussion uh, before, before five. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. My 20 minutes will start in a moment. Uh, <laughs> um, it's really a pleasure not only to be here to discuss climate change, but to experience it. Um, and apropos of the uh, discussion of tenuousness in the earlier panel, I was reminded of something I hadn't thought about for a long time, that the standard for residency permit under the old German, uh, they call it the Aliens Law, the Ausländer Gesetz, was a very interesting German phrase that I don't think is used much anymore. It was whether a person is Gastfreundschaft würdig, which meant worthy of hospitality. So I come to you hoping to be Gastfreundschaft würdig as I go forward. Um, it's really an honor to be here to speak about this topic. I want to consider two uh, specific issues from a political legal perspective. The first is how might we understand, situate, and critique expulsion from the nation state, a phenomenon that was implicit in some of the earlier conversations but that we really didn't get to, um, and in the European context specifically. I'm going to use the terms expulsion and deportation interchangeably, even though we could have a whole conversation about the imprecision that that causes, but I'll tell you what I mean by expulsion in a moment. Uh, second, more broadly, I want to consider the role played by refugee and human rights law relating to non-citizens in the current crisis, and crisis we can take advisedly as a discussion point. Um, I will suggest that the role has been quite significant and that our full understanding of the current situation demands not only a technically nuanced understanding of legal structures and process, but also a dyna dynamic, evolving understanding of the relationship between law and politics, which in some sense is obvious, but in another sense is very intricate and difficult to achieve. Um, I want to highlight that the meaning of citizenship, in this case EU citizenship, is, as Saskia Sassen once put it, quote, partly produced by the practices of the excluded, end quote. This is a sort of starting point for much of what I want to say about the, the, the demos. Um, I contend that non-citizens, third country nationals, asylum seekers, etc., are an essential part of the dynamic process of defining the EU polity itself and of mediating the inevitable tension between majoritarian power and the rule of law. As Bonnie Honig has suggested, we should thus reframe the traditional question, how should we solve the problem of foreignness? That question inevitably leads us to ask what we should do about them. A more intriguing and useful inquiry, I think, is to ask what problems does foreignness solve for us? The essential point was made famously by Herman Cohen, quote, in the alien man discovered the idea of humanity, end quote. So I think that through non-citizens' legal participation in the polity, we discover richer, more just ideas of participation and of the polity itself. And this is an important part of the reason why, and it's relevant to this discussion very much, as David Cole has noted, we must fight the temptation to trade their rights for our security. And I think that's a lot of what is happening in Europe today. 
So I want to consider certain aspects of what I term transcendent law, by which I mean basically law that transcends a particular nation's state, which I think have had powerful restraining effects on governments and nascent reactionary politics already in Europe. And I recognize this is a bit of a more optimistic take on things than others have offered. So, and I'm not normally accused of optimism, I should say, by, by my children or friends or anybody. Um, but I'm thinking here not only of refugee and human rights law, but also of norms of anti-discrimination, deeply protective principles of proportionality, protection of family, protections against torture, and more generically, a certain basic background understandings of sovereignty and human rights. I think it is very important in this moment that we recognize these principles, understand them, incorporate them into any critical analysis of current trends, and ultimately I think they need to be cherished and strengthened. So I'm going to speak for about six months now, so um, please make yourselves comfortable because there's a lot of subjects here. Um, let me first talk about uh, expulsion, a phenomenon that ties many of these strands together. My title asks the question whether deportation is different. By this I mean to analogize deportation to the death penalty, which has famously been recognized by the U.S. Supreme Court as different. In the United States, deportation has been described by a prominent immigration judge as equivalent to the death penalty in a traffic court setting." End quote. The, these analogies are always perilous, but I think the analogy here may be somewhat apt if complex. Um, the penalty of death was described by Justice Stewart as differing from other forms of criminal punishment, quote, not in degree but in kind, end quote. It was unique in its total irrevocability, obviously, in its rejection of rehabilitation, and in its absolute renunciation of all that is embodied in our conception of humanity, he wrote. Now, one must also, I think, add that it is invariably applied in racially problematic, if not invidious, ways. Deportation involves, of course, many methodologies and many forms, including some that apply informally at or near the border and some that are even denominated voluntary. But the harshest forms, though formalistically civil in most countries, though not in France, raise similar concerns to the death penalty. These forms, which I have termed post-entry social control, apply to those otherwise permitted to reside legally and permanently in a state. And I think if we see the most optimistic vision, which I think Alex Alenikov has, of how the cases are going to be processed in Europe, we are going to see hundreds of thousands of new permanent residents, so-called, in Europe, who then are going to be in a sort of tenuous status until they gain citizenship. So this prospect of expulsion is not necessarily uh, you know, hypothetical. So I'm thinking particularly of the, the forced removal of long-term legal residents who enter the nation state as young children. And this, of course, is a major phenomenon in the United States. Um, these sorts of deportations, I think, at the very least, cry out for the application of substantive norms of proportionality, protection of family, equal protection, etc. In fact, like the death penalty, they inspire some, and I might put myself in that camp, although we can talk more about the details, to call for their abolition entirely. But even the less stark forms of deportation, which I generically would call extended border control forms, demand strong procedural protections and substantive limits. Now, I've spent much of my career arguing that deportation is a central component of U.S. history and that it is best understood as a distinct political legal phenomenon. Um, and since the mid-20th century as a distinct system with its own history, dynamics, anomalies, harsh effects, metastatic tendencies, and deep legitimacy problems. Um, and I, I won't um, go into the details on this in the interest of time, but simply to say that for the last quarter century or so, the United States, despite or perhaps because of its aspirations to identify as a nation of immigrants has been engaged in a massive radical experiment with deportation. Um, this has developed into a huge, expensive, harsh, and rigid enterprise affecting hundreds of thousands of people annually. We don't know the exact number of long-term legal residents who have been deported, but best estimates are many, many thousands, many of whom have families, and most of whom were deported due to conviction of relatively minor crimes. Now, deportation in Europe has not, or has not yet, become a phenomenon of the magnitude that it is in the United States, although scholars such as Matt Gibney at Oxford have spoken of a deportation turn in Europe for nearly a decade. Nevertheless, it is a major system, and I think worthy of serious attention and concern, especially under current conditions. <clears throat> 
This is not only due to the large numbers of deportations from Europe, and by this I mean removals of EU nationals, Dublin transfers, and of course removals of third country nationals, TCNs. Statistics are very complex and trends are hard to assess definitively across the EU. Still, according to Eurostat, in the past few years, well over 400,000 third country nationals who have exhausted all legal avenues to legitimize their stay in the EU or who have committed offenses in the EU were ordered to leave and to return to their countries of origin. Now, not all of those orders have been executed. In uh, 2011, Dublin transfers accounted for 23% of these sorts of these removals. That's according to National, not Eurostat, where, uh, records and according to a, a scholar named Leanne Weber at Monash University who's been co compiling some of this. Also, the actual implementation of deportation is complicated. We have to consider in this regard, and it's funny that the name hasn't come up yet, um, Frontex. Um, and I want to suggest that this is the agency that is actually implemented, a very interesting agency. In fact, I want to suggest as a thought point that Frontex is developing a unique and new conception of what I am calling dynamic sovereignty. And I give a nod here to Alex Alinikov, who wrote a very interesting book called Semblances of Sovereignty that set me to thinking along some of these lines. But I think this is a sort of derivative sovereignty in motion pertaining to deportees. The question comes up, who is the sovereign when a person is in transit being deported? What ha you know, who, who is the rule of law there? Anyway, I don't have time to pursue this dynamic sovereignty idea today, but if you pursue it, please remember to mention this talk in your footnote my name is spelled K-A-N-S-T-R-O-O-M. Still, the essential fact is that we are talking about a large, important, and growing system in the EU. Its political legal implications are profound, and its normative challenges need to be confronted as directly as possible. In this regard, we should also note it, the calls in Europe for denationalization, a precursor to deportation. Fortunately, France stepped back from the brink a few days ago, but trends in the UK, the Netherlands, Denmark, and elsewhere bear watching closely, and I think bear worrying about a lot. The British Nationality Act, for example, authorizes the Home Secretary to deprive a person of British citizenship, here's the standard, where she is, quote, satisfied that deprivation is conducive to the public good, end quote. That is the same standard, by the way, for deportation of a, of a, a long-term resident. So one thing is going to pretty inev inevitably lead to the other. Um, the UK declines to publicly disclose the exact number, identities, or circumstances of those deprived of UK citizenship, but journalists estimate that more than 50 people have lost UK citizenship since 2002. About half of those were on national security grounds. It's been a rising trend, or at least as Peter Spiro engagingly described it, a trendlet. Um, of course, denationalization as such is not a new idea. The European Convention on Nationality provides for revocation of citizenship, quote, for conduct seriously prejudicial to the vital interests of the state party, and there are similar provisions in the 1961 Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness. Still, um, this seriously prejudicial behavior standard is a ground for revocation of citizenship in many countries. In Belgium, interestingly enough, the last time I checked, and I, I have to say I haven't I didn't get a chance to update this, so correct me if I'm wrong, but the last time I checked, denationalization may be based on a threat to the security of the state and to national independence, but only by active collaboration with the enemy in time of war, which actually raises interesting questions regarding how ISIS people are conceptualized. In Switzerland, the Ministry of Justice can deprive dual citizens of their Swiss citizenship if their behavior severely damages the interests or reputation of Switzerland, which I may have done uh, inadvertently in reference to something. But um, in any case, part of what is at issue here is the basic understanding of citizenship and of the polity, the demos. Here we see two models, as was discussed earlier. One is this sort of reciprocal contractual bond represented by the IJC as early as 1955 in the Notabom case. Nationality is a legal bond. It has the reciprocal rights and duties. That's one vision. As the Canadian immigration minister put Chris Alexander put it in support of the pre-Trudeau Strengthening Canadian Citizenship Act, the issue is one of, quote, loyalty and allegiance. I think that's the, that's the move. Um, an alternative model, which I, I want to champion, situates denationalization against a broader backdrop in which pervasive rights deprivations against non-citizens are also central components. This is less formally citizenship-centered and more functionally rights-centered. And obviously, there's an Arendtian argument we need to have about this. 
By right-centered, I mean essentially to measure state power and state practices against the norms of a fully developed human rights protection system. And I'm not saying that Europe has such a fully developed system, but it's a lot closer than the United States is. In this way, one might see denationalization along a continuum of state practices that use citizenship status and territorial formalism to achieve policy goals with weakened, and in some cases no, rule of law encumbrances. What this would mean is that one would not only criticize or critique the British conducive to the public goods standard as relegating citizens, it would equally question the standard's legitimacy and propriety for non-citizens. This point, I think, is crucial. In sum, my main point here is that denationalization is part of the phenomenon of expulsion itself and in turn part of a more basic challenge to the primacy of human rights in Europe. So let me talk a bit more about expulsion. My basic understanding of it is as follows. Expulsion processes are a powerful government assertion of high stakes sanctions in low formality settings aimed at the most powerless and marginalized members of society. Now expulsion, of course, is a contingent phenomenon in that its significance requires a meta-theory of the nation state and, for our purposes, of the EU in terms of borders, sovereignty, composition of the demos, etc. But I believe that to view it as purely derivative or contingent would be a mistake, indeed a dangerous mistake. Put simply, expulsion in its various forms and with its various restraints by legal rights mechanisms is itself a critical component of our understanding of the nature of the EU, its current crisis, and the evolution of the demos. It is where the rubber of state power meets the road of normativity, to, to make something up off the top of my head. The expulsion of non-citizens also dovetails with our understanding of refugees and asylum seekers, to tie this back to the earlier panel. These things are often confused. Obviously, refugees and those entitled to asylum are special categories. But there's, a, there's an irony here. The more we focus on the rights of refugees and asylum seekers, um, it tends to legitimize the removals of those who don't qualify for such specific protections. Now, one way to resolve this is to loosen the standards for adjudicating asylum claims, and I would fully support that if, if it happens, and Alex thinks it is going to happen in Europe, and I, I hope that's true. Um, but still, there is a tension here, obviously, in terms of how we conceptualize the sources of these rights. Once we establish a class of people deemed worthy of special care, and again, I'm, of course, not suggesting that they are not, just to be clear, but it does make the discourse about others more complicated. And it's in this regard that European norms relating to proportionality, family life, privacy, and protection from torture, etc., are incredibly important. I have to say I was struck to hear Demetrius Papadimitriou in his September 2015 interview say that those people who are economic migrants must be returned. This was in the context of reaffirming the primacy of protections for refugees and asylum seekers. I, I, I just want, I'd like to talk with him more about that. Anyway, recently some attempts have been made to codify and to progressively realize the rights of non-citizens who face deportation. I just want to conclude by talking about two of them, one of which is a project that I'm working on. One approach, which has been more than a decade in the making through the International Law Commission in the UN, is called the Draft Articles on the Rights of Aliens and Expulsion Proceedings. And if you haven't read these draft articles, I really urge you to do so. They're easily available on the web with actually extensive commentary. It's a very comprehensive, but to my mind, a very problematic document, though I don't have time today to discuss all the problems. The virtue is that the draft articles do help us to move forward to conceptualize deportation as a distinct phenomenon, which I've suggested I think is very important. And in some respects, they are path-breaking in an attempt to enhance certain progressive, na or certain nascent norms. But they leave significant questions unanswered. And one of the most important problems with them is an architecture that reflects what the drafters view as a tension among three things. One, what they call the sovereign right of the state to expel a person. Second, the rights of the alien subject to expulsion. And third, the rights, again, this is the actual word, of the expelling state in relation to the state of destination of the person expelled. I think that, that using such rights phrasing as applied to state sovereignty is significant and dangerous, even when one modifies it by rights provisions. And maybe in questions we can come back to why that is. 
But it is true that framing such power as a state's right to expel recalls rather absolutist and binary decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court about the state power to, uh, ex to exclude and deport. This language deflects attention from the inherent complexity of conceptualizing deportation. How else might you conceptualize it? You might pierce the rhetoric of sovereign absolute power or right and foreground the human rights of the subjects of this newly ascendant, well-described by others, formidable machinery, end quote. We would then see that expulsion is not best described as a right of states. It is an awesome power of states, legitimate and legal in some of its manifestations, but I would argue illegitimate in some of its increasingly prevalent forms. We should also not forget uh, that the rise of deportation systems in Europe reflects deep global inequalities that are protected by the nation state system and its borders. Even if one does not, and I do not, advocate for the abolition of the nation state system, we should note that border control and removal systems are fundamentally designed to maintain a status quo that derives from what Ayala Shahar has aptly critiqued as an unjust birthright lottery with disturbingly feudal attributes on a global scale. And in this regard, I have to say, I was thinking at the end of the last panel when people were talking about crisis, the analogy came to my mind of the world as a hemophiliac and some of the migration movements are bleeding. And so you can look at the bleeding, of course, and you can say, well, there's the crisis. But the crisis is the hemophilia. That's the, the, the problem. So this is just a, a metaphor that uh, use it as, if, you, if you think it's useful. Um, anyway, I suggest in sum that the best approach to understanding, critiquing, and restraining expulsion is to strongly reaffirm the status of existing rights. And here's a point that Saskia Sassen made just before she left, and I, I wish she could have stayed to hear it and to view those who face expulsion as a definable legal class with specific cognizable rights. That's the, the big takeaway that I want to offer you today. So as an alternative, or perhaps a sort of friendly amendment to the draft articles, I would urge you to consider the idea of a declaration on the rights of expelled and deported persons, which we have drafted after three conferences, Shayla Ben Habib was at one of them, uh, sponsored by the Post-Deportation Human Rights Project that I founded at Boston College Law School. This is available on the website at PDHRP, and I would suggest that this approach helps us to better foreground the individuals and families affected by expulsion and better to understand the significance of such claims to the future of the EU. It also could serve as a sort of lodestar, a point of navigational reference for those who advocate for institutional reform systems in Europe and elsewhere. Its instantiation of deportees as a legal class renders their rights claims more regular, more understandable, and it implies a certain solidarity among those who have faced deportation in disparate settings. Now, of course, there are a lot of complexities here, but I'm not sure that the differences in the people facing deportation is much different from the sorts of things that have risen to the, to the level of being understood as persecution. If you think of political opinion, religion, you know, all sorts of other things. So food for thought. The declaration is largely aimed at procedural coordination, but it does have substantive provisions, particularly norms of non-discrimination in the countries to which deportees are sent. This has been a big problem for the US and the Dominican Republic in El Salvador and Jamaica and elsewhere. And it focuses on the rights of, of deportees to medical care, to having identity documents, to being able to visit their families, to be treated as persons by the state that deported them even after they've been deported so their rights don't fall into a sort of juridical black hole, to have rights of continued participation in legal proceedings if they feel they have been wrongly uh, deported, and, and so on. It also confirms a right to respect for family life and more specifically provides that deportation should not be like a death penalty. It should not be for Ever. States should allow avenues for family reunification and should generously grant requests for visits through visas or parole to enable deportees to visit their families with appropriate safeguards and so forth. So it's a way of sort of ameliorating uh, some of the harshness of these things. Let me conclude by just saying something that is probably obvious uh, in this approach. Um, I don't view this, uh, and I, I doubt that anybody in the room does, but I always feel like I should say it, uh, as, as charity work. This is not something that we do for them. I think in the United States and in Europe, um, the goal is to maintain a legitimate, decent, uh, 
fair, humane, diverse concept of the demos that does not use citizenship status as a fulcrum for oppression. I think in the long run this, is, this will benefit us all. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to begin by uh, thanking Professor Ben Habib and Professor Harcourt um, for inviting me to speak today um, at this very timely and important conference. Um, I want to talk about the reception of migrants and refugees pr from the point of view of the ethos and telos of the European Union itself. Um, as Professor Ben Habib observed in her introduction, the distinction between economic migrants and refugees is deeply flawed, um, but it is important um, for countering the pernicious claim that the thousands of people um, drowning in the Mediterranean, suffocating in trucks, and being trafficked by criminals um, are quote-unquote economic migrants. People fleeing war-torn places like Syria, Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, or Eritrea often have valid claims to asylum under the UN Convention and Protocol relating to the status of refugees. Now, in European public discourse, uh, economic migrant has regrettably um, become a toxic term, a shorthand for marauding opportunists looking uh, to siphon off Europe's hard-earned wealth. I want to argue that as far as the European integration project is concerned, there's a deep perversity at work here. The EU is essentially the most extensive regime of economic migration in existence. Since the signing of the Treaty of Paris establishing the European coal and steel community in 1951, the free movement of labor has been one of the central planks of the supranational legal system put into place. The 1957 Treaty of Rome establishing the European Economic Community expanded the principle of the free movement of labor um, to all member state um, citizens uh, uh, who received offers of employment from abroad. What's more, the free movement of labor had a social justice objective right from the very start. The European economic community was not designed to be a redistributive scheme in any area other than arguably agricultural policy. Rather, it aimed at an equitable distribution of the benefits and burdens of market integration by encouraging people to move where the jobs were. That is to say, it hoped to accomplish social solidarity through a market mechanism. Of course, we can debate the wisdom of accomplishing social justice goals through the market, but this was the choice made by the founders of the European project. Initially conceived as a reciprocal policy objective among member states, the free movement of labor acquired a different constitutionalized status under European law. As the European Court of Justice began translating the objectives enshrined in the Treaty of Rome into subjective rights owed to individuals by member states, the free movement of labor acquired the title of a quote-unquote fundamental freedom under European community law, along with the other freedoms of movement of goods, services, and capital. It's considered a fundamental freedom. That's the legal term for it. In other words, economic migration became a fundamental freedom uh, thanks to EC law. So foremost among the EU's constitutional principles is the right of member state citizens to seek a better livelihood abroad. The legal right to economic migration, even more than the passport-free border crossing regime, is the EU's distinctive accomplishment. So as Professor Alenikov pointed out in his talk earlier today, um, Schengen might be in danger, but that fundamental structure of free mobility between member states on the part of their citizens is very well established and deeply rooted. The EU celebrates plucky Europeans who cross borders to snag a labor contract in another member state as standard bearers of a new cosmopolitan work ethic. 
if they falter in their host states, EU law ensures that the host state's welfare system will be there to catch them. Through its decades-long case law, the Court of Justice of the European Union has ensured that migrant EU workers receive family and student allowances, unemployment benefits, job seekers allowances, and generally any other kind of social benefit afforded to a member state's own citizens, even if they have not contributed a single euro to the host state's tax the fiscal system. Somehow, though, the category of economic migrant becomes a pejorative if the migrant in question lacks an EU passport. It's no longer a fundamental freedom if you don't have an EU passport. So migration is perhaps the starkest example of how the EU confers privilege on some human beings uh, but allows its member states to consign others to predation on the morally arbitrary basis of nationality. The treatment that asylum seekers and economic migrants typically receive in the EU and its member states stands in dramatic contrast accorded to mobile, European, mobile EU citizens. Um, mobile EU citizens are greeted with the bright welcome mat of EU law, while non-EU citizens fare soaring walls, barbed wire, militarized police, and um, uh, Frontex that was just mentioned, which sounds more like a pesticide than a government agency that would represent people. <sighs> Migrants have, uh, and asylum seekers have for years faced the ineffective Dublin system that forces them to seek asylum in their first countries of entry. Um, countries like Italy and Greece, which the European Court of Human Rights uh, not an EU body, has held are unable to grant humane treatment um, on such a large scale. Now, many people committed to European integration like to think of the EU as something more than a crude economic union. But an economic union that pursues the telos of market integration also has an ethos. And that ethos, in this respect at least, is potentially more universalistic than most nation states. What we might call the EU's cosmopolitan accomplishments are, for the most part, rooted and nourished by its commercial objectives. Of course, there's intense disagreement about the merits of market liberalization in general and the ruthless way in which the EU has pursued it. Um, so diehard free marketeers and ordo liberals aside, most people find the EU's focus on market liberalization to be lopsided and harmful to other values such as social inclusion and social justice, solidarity, and other sorts of non-material values. But let's think for a moment uh, in the mode of imminent critique. Let's reason within the EU's market-centered universe of values, which is what we have to hand. From this perspective, whether or not we like the idea of market liberalization, it can, at least in theory, um, argue in fa favor of easing the circulation of factors of production between states, and that, in the EU's legal system, includes labor. The EU's free movement regime has been accompanied by the development of strong legal norms against discriminatory treatment on the basis of nationality. The Court of Justice of the European Union holds member states to extremely stringent criteria of equal treatment between citizens and foreigners, if the foreigners are, as long as the foreigners are holders of um, uh, some, some EU member state nationality. So without question, the EU's market building project has diminished the salience of internal political borders between member states in a far more fundamental way than the Schengen passport free travel regime. But if the EU is to be consistent with this ethos of commercial cosmopolitanism, it has an obligation to leverage the inherent universalism of the market as a countervailing force against member states and their ex exclusionary impulses. Now, we can totally have a conversation about, you know, the market and its various problems, like I said, but again, reasoning from within the EU's own market-centered universe of values, which, whether we like it or not, is there. Um, I want to suggest um, that creates a sort of obligation to overcome this perversity within its migration regime. 
or the EU should just drop the whole universalist pretense, but it can't have it both ways. So I can hear um, a very clear objection to this argument, which is that the right of free movement um, is a privilege attached to EU citizenship and not a universal right. It's a club good um, that member states agree to provide to one another citizens on a basis of reciprocity, um, not as a, as a universal entitlement to all of humankind. So in this respect, the EU acts like any nation state that allows internal but not external free movement. In fact, um, the free movement rights enshrined in the 1957 Treaty of Rome have, for the most part, had um, an open-ended and universalistic construction in the text of the treaty. But the Treaty of Maastricht, which established the status of EU citizenship um, in 1993, tied free movement rights to a particular and exclusive EU citizenship status. In other words, the much celebrated civic innovation of EU citizenship actually made the EU's free movement provisions less cosmopolitan. The fact that the EU's external migration policy more and more resembles that of a nation state is precisely the problem. Part of the EU's legitimating narrative has always been that supranational institutions embody a more universalistic and rational form of political organization compared to nation states. The founders of the European Integration Project viewed nation states as blinkered by ethnic narcissism and by solipsistic understandings of their interests. Supranational institutions were supposed to rise above all that, to embody a commitment to universalism, rational decision-making through dialogue, impartiality, and so on. So supranationalism has, in a sense, always been defined in opposition to nationalism. So whatever you think about market liberalization and its relative merits, I think there's something to this narrative of a cosmopolitanism that's essentially commercial, but that can nevertheless counterbalance the nation state's limited scope of concern. The EU's supranational organs, most notably its court of justice, um, its, uh, well, the parliament, but depends on who's, uh, who's in the majority, um, and the European Commission, have on the whole been far more receptive to the demands of third country nationals compared to the council and the member states. The commission has consistently pushed for equal treatment and equal rights for third country nationals who are long-term residents. It even floated a civic citizenship proposal for them, which alas failed. Um, it's also pursued a more liberal policy of admission for the European Union, but admission um, remains within the competence of the member states, so the commission can only recommend it, but you know, can't really legislate on it. Um, so member states retain, in theory, the right to determine the number of migrants that they're willing to admit into their territory from outside of the EU, but the commission has sought to harmonize the criteria that they would use for admitting economic migrants, including minimum standards of admission and procedures for accelerated admission. Of course, the commission doesn't do all of this because it's, uh, you know, necessarily because it's a principled cosmopolitan institution. The commission is in charge, of, first and foremost, of ensuring that the EU's um, objectives are met. Uh, many of these objectives have to do with the smooth operation of the single market. Um, so many of the c concerns that drive the commission in this are economic. So, for instance, it tells... Um, it, you know, it's one of the few institutions willing to tell the member states the cold, hard truth about their demogra demographies. Without the boost of an immigrant workforce, the expansive social welfare states um, to which most European states are committed um, or have until recently been committed will no longer be sustainable given uh, an aging native population. It's also argued that immigration helps to combat economic stagnation and bottlenecks in the labor market, obviously all economic arguments. Um, so in a public address last year, former uh, president of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Barroso, argued that the EU needed a new narrative because the post-war narrative of making war between member states unthinkable had run its course, had, had lost its mobilizing power. Um, I agree with them, and I think that the centerpiece of this new narrative should be that of an open continent, one that stays 
true to the principle that economic migration is a dynamic that benefits everyone, both migrants and host societies. It should be combating this extremely misleading um, and ultimately pernicious discourse that refugees are a burden on their host societies, um, because especially in the case of this aging continent, this actually might be the influx that they need to jumpstart their economies. Again, I'm, I'm reasoning from within the logic of the internal market, and I'm, I'm saying nothing about the sort of inherent moral claims that, that these um, people have. Now, we often hear it said that unlike the US, EU countries are not countries of immigration. Demographically and historically, I think this claim is false. Europe is a continent of migrants, um, and it, I think it falls to the EU to emphasize that. Um, now, people might object that the EU actually lacks the kind of political credibility needed to champion greater migration at a time of stiff um, xenophobic crosswinds. Um, but the EU is already seen as kind of a foreign plant in many member states. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, the, the idea that Brussels is flooding our country with foreigners would play right into the hands of the far right. But the thing to remember is that the EU is often defended in terms of its ability to do unpopular things. Member states delegate power to supranational institutions precisely because the policy decisions with which they're charged can be unpopular with national publics. Things like combating protectionism, enforcing competition rules, ensuring fiscal discipline um, are deeply unpopular decisions and that's why uh, some of these EU institutions that are attenuated from democratic control have been put in charge of them. Um, so on demographic gr uh, grounds alone, immigration is a similar issue on which majoritarian mechanisms often yield outcomes that are contrary if the interests of the European citizens, if their preference is to maintain their general welfare state systems. Um, so I think it falls to the EU to shift to an affirmative narrative of itself as a continent of immigration both internally and externally. That narrative is already in place internally, um, and I'm suggesting that it needs to be extended to the external dimension as well. Thank you. Okay, I too want to thank uh, Bernard and uh, Sheila for including me in this conversation. It is a conversation. In fact, much of what I have here to say uh, resonates with uh, what da uh, Daniel and Trukler just said, and so footnotes will be added appropriately. Um, this is a, a, the, the comments which I'm going to make, which are rather telegraphic in their, in their mode of presentation, are extracted for a much longer uh, piece uh, that I've been writing for the last few months, whenever I get a chance to get to it, um, about the European Union uh, and the problematic language of crisis. This is a, an exercise in exploring what I've been calling left governmentality uh, in, with various pieces in the last few years. So, so it, it, I've excised the references that point backwards and forwards, but, but it still reads a bit sort of in suspended mode. So anyway, let me start by registering a simple historical and simultaneously philological point. The word refugee first appears in French after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, 1685, to designate those Protestants, the Huguenots, forced to flee the rightful place of inhabitants in search of asylum to other dominions. In this specific way, les réfugiés sont les réfugiés. In an uncanny matching of the condition of rejection and exclusion with a presumed right of acceptance and inclusion. Refugees may now be defined by the condition of seeking or securing a refuge, but in essence the opposite defines them. They exist because they have been refused. My concern here, as I said very briefly, is to point to an endemic logic in the social imaginary of the European Union that works precisely in this perverse way of reversal, of sort of Orwellian doublespeak. This is already inherent in the EU's constitutive logic of borderless borders that exists way before the so-called refugee crisis. 
In fact, it is the logic that produces the so-called crisis, even if there are specific social historical events that may play a role. I insist on the qualifier so-called because I'm amazed with, at the ease with which the notion of crisis is bantered about with presumably different qualifiers. A few months ago we had an economic crisis, now we have a refugee crisis, but are they different? Are they a matter of crisis? Or is the language of crisis merely the modus operandi of this formation? I will give a, a, a sort of flash account of the elements that affect the situation by, by asserting what I see as five conditional terrains of so-called fortress Europe, both contemporary and also kind of back historical a bit, starting from the contemporary backwards. Uh, condition one, before we even consider the problem of borders and so-called refugee crisis, I would assert that as it stands now, the EU is a failed socio-political formation simply because the economic element has taken over the sphere of the political at a primary level. This is the same mechanism that in the name of globalization has ensured the debilitation of national sovereignty despite the nominal persistence of the nation-state form. As, I, as I've argued several times, the key institution of national sovereignty is not the state per se, but the national economy. The moment that the workings of national economy are dismantled, national sovereignty de facto ends no matter the name or the flag that sustains the apparent symbolic existence of a state. In retrospect, as far as the EU is concerned, the logic of this condition seems to have been always in effect. The Eurozone is nothing but a symptom of the original and unadulterated logic of the EEC. The original EEC, you remember, the U European Econ Economic Community, could be read just as well as the ECC, the European Community of Commodities. In this category of commodities, I would most certainly include the European peoples themselves. As this logic unfolded from its initial liberal framework to uh, a neoliberal one, it produced the monetary union as a playground for the most powerful financial interests worldwide, a kind of money laundering scheme through the taxation of poorer strata. Banking debt was nationalized and made a burden to bear by a community of commodified consumers. Although to say nationalized invokes again the parameters of national sovereignty, note that this very nationalization of debt signifies the exact opposite, further erosion of national sovereignty. At the same time, a community of consumers, commodified consumers, as I put it, means precisely a community beyond national borders in the sense that they are consumers, consumers of the European idea, presumably made available to them via a whole array of commodities, one of which is, of course, debt itself. We're talking about quite a scheme. Condition two. The Eurozone presumably signifies the ultimate deterritorialization and dissolution of borders. But this dissolution of borders is only in place for the benefit of capital, which doesn't recognize borders anyway. Again, we might see this as the incursion of the economic into the political. Borderless sovereignty is a figure of capital, and its achievement in the form of the EU is but the actualization of a logic that has been in place and in effect for a long time. What this formation really put into effect, despite the presumption of the notion of community, was the dissolution of national so sovereignty without, however, diluting the elements of racial nationalism. In fact, the contrary happened. The more national sovereignty was effectively defanged, the more nationalism and racism was consolidated. The even greater failure of the EU, EU project in this respect was that it brought about the very thing it was supposed to have overcome in a kind of bizarre, perverted manifestation of Hegelian Aufhebung, where the element of preservation in the act of overcoming becomes the most dominant. For instead of quelling nationalist violence, the EU produced the intensification of nationalist and always in that sense racist violence in ways that now present themselves as even more complicated given the entwinement of multiple social cultural modes across the borders that were presumed to have been abolished. We're talking about quite a scam, which is in effect becoming plainly evident in the veritable construction of actual borders, barriers, walls, fences, to block the racially excluded others exactly on the marks of previous national borders. <laughs> 
The utterly perverse replay of history where the Dachau and Buchenwald concentration camps are being put to use again to house the masses of racially others who have managed to slip through and infiltrate the native terrain is a perfect symptom. As is Denmark's decision to confiscate wealth of incoming refugees as advance payment for their being allowed territorial entry. It is, in this sense, it's a no-brainer to, to name these new borders in the presumably borderless union spaces of exception. We don't need Agamben for this, although it's true, he did call it early on. Up until very recently, indeed, this summer, when the Syrian front collapsed and hundreds of thousands of people ended up in Greek beaches, many of them dead on arrival, the EU rhetoric cynically manipulated rubrics of humanitarianism in order to steadily implement and enhance a militarization of its borderless borders. In 2013, after the two major Lampedusa disasters, the so-called Mediterranean Task Force, in effect a consolidation of Frontex and Europol, began the process of military patrol of the seas under the presumption of averting nautical disasters, but in effect creating conditions of interdiction with the aspiration of dissuading passage into EU land. Remarkably, such practices of interdiction in the high seas were soon deemed counterproductive because the alleged saving of peoples from drowning, even though it meant internment of them in, on land, was seen as a motivating indicator for greater influx. The highlight of these efforts, the extraordinary program instituted by the Italian government under the revitalized Roman name Mare Nostrum, seemed to be a moment of national sovereignty reasserting itself in the midst of nation-state depolitization by the political arms of global capital. Yet even in this case, a national government and a national budget, extraordinarily high, 9 million euros a month was the cost of this operation. Unsustainable were being put in the service of EU elite interests, thereby confirming the loss of sovereignty even while acting in its name. Now, I do want to take a parenthesis to note the fantastic list of names given to the operation of protecting Fortress Europe, Greco-Roman names, okay? Xenius Zeus, this, was the f this is a Greek operation to round up immigrants, where hospitality becomes hostility. <laughs> Hermes. Triton, which was previously Frontex Plus, Perseus, Mare Nostrum, I mentioned that already, Poseidon Land. This Greco-Roman alphabet of control is to me one of the most cynical expression, or exp expressions of, of EU bureaucratic elites, and it confirms their appropriation of Mediterranean antiquity as a means of dismissing and discounting the modern realities of southern and eastern populations including, of course, the civilizational categories of what is presumed to be non-European. But to return to this issue of militarized so-called humanitarianism and pseudonymous national sovereignty, the so-called refugee crisis and the problem of borders that it brings to the forefront shows clearly that there is no way that single nations in the south facing the sea can deal with Europe's migration problems in return for economic incentives. On the contrary, the perverse and nightmarishly Orwellian face of pseudonymous values, as I've been describing them, seems to have no conceivable end to its capacity. I recall Gideon Rachman in the Financial Times, this is an article from late January, making what was in effect a perfectly swift and modest proposal, except that it was not meant to be satirical. He offered as a solution the idea that Greece would be substantially forgiven its debt in exchange for sealing its northern land borders completely and storing the influx of refugees in concentration camps on the islands where they land until the Syria conflict were to be resolved, at which point the refugees would be returned. Now, we've had some developments since then, but think of it in this light. Far be it that this is a singular expression by a recognizably cynical voice in the best neoliberal fashion. I don't know if you follow his articles in the Financial Times. They're just deplorable. The idea of Greece thrown out of Schengen was very much banter about in the quarters of Brussels, as we know, and it continues to be palpably real. It only remains to establish exactly what its price will be. It's really all about whether this will be negotiated in terms of debt forgiveness. 
Condition three. Let's draw back and consider the broader geographical history. I mean, some of this was done also in the first session very well. While the presumed dissolution of borders in the EU was also put into effect in order to facilitate movement of labor, according to the original logic of the EEC, which is mentioned, labor too, remember, is a commodity, so the ECC thing keeps playing, it nonetheless produced strict borders of exclusion in the labor market in terms different from the ethno-political lines of the otherwise, in any case, dismantled national sovereignty. So extraordinary internal borders were imposed to contain the massive migration of cheap labor from spaces surrounding the EU. First, from collapsed ex-Soviet societies, the Balkans, Caucasus, Poland, etc. The new waves of post-colonial migration, Asian, African, Caribbean, chiefly into the UK, France, and Holland. And finally, the post-Iraq and Afghanistan and now Syria debacle. While the formal distinction between refugees and immigrants may need to be maintained, I think this is some discussion we definitely need to have. Nonetheless, the element of cheap or so-called or undocumented labor remains a common factor in both and very much the determining element. Even if not quite as cause of migration in the case of political refugees, then certainly as, as its effect or end point. This is why the recent agreement broker between the EU and Turkey is a scandalous pretension on more fronts, of course, than I can mention here in the time allotted. Here, there's much merit to Amir's, Amir Mufti's position that every country that becomes part of the EU is implicated inexorably in Europe's colonial and post-colonial position regardless of its history. So, for example, Greece, which was never a colonial power, and in many ways it has a history of being colonized, not in terms of land occupation, but more in terms of the occupation of its imaginary, I've argued this long time in Dream Nation, comes to inherit all the problems of post-coloniality insofar as it participates in the phenomena of massive immigration because of its EU status. People who come to Greece, about which they know nothing, seeing it as Europe, bring into it all their assumptions about Europe and the West, and when they might subsequently receive a similar xenophobic reception of the culturally other, in a country where what is self and other in the context of the West and East is inordinately complicated, to say the least, they cannot be asked to determine the difference. This condition of befuddlement pertains both to the immigrants and to the Greeks. So in this sense, the rise of neo-Nazi or neo-fascist elements in Greece, but I would argue this to be the case in the other situations, Hungary and Poland, is not merely a rehashing of old indigenous nationalism, which it is, but it's not merely that, but a kind of intra-European, and in that sense, colonial racism, which would otherwise be absent. Indeed, we're talking about a scam in which those scams involve virtually everyone but the highest elites. When the EU moved against Italy in spring 2014 and dissolved Mare Nostrum, Europe held a negative side, the militarization of immigration control, and rejected the positive, the saving of immigrants and refugees from drowning at sea and transportation and being transported to European land. In this fashion, it remained consistent with two basic principles that pertain to EU immigration policy for almost a decade. The closing off of legal pathways to Europe, which is the main reason immigration became criminalized, and the continuation of militarized border control in the continuation of militarized border control. In this sense, Europe selected, in essence, to persist in, a dead, in the dead end that it itself had created. The ultimate project in this quandary is the creation of a high-tech panopticon system of surveillance on the outer borders of the EU, which would achieve, this is the presumption, which would achieve same-time virtualization of all that takes place in the vicinity. I have no idea how this can happen. This was officially inaugurated as EUROSUR, it has a name, European System of Border Surveillance, in October 2013, and has yet to achieve full implementation, but provides the perfect image of Fortress Europe in critical condition. Frontex is everywhere present and nowhere exposed. Condition four. In the last decade, before things unraveled, the dimensions of ethnic, racial, and cultural exclusion grew immensely under the project of the presumed EU consolidation. While divisions of this kind existed since the outset of decolonization, 
they were severely augmented by the EU formation, partly because the influx of peoples from the periphery increased under the cultivated aspiration of greater flow and absorption into the Euro socioeconomic sphere. But most significant was another factor. In the era of national sovereignty, the problem of assimilation of post-colonial populations was conducted within the limits of each colonial state itself with its own specific racist exclusions. But with the EU forming in response to and as consequence of globalization, the vision and promise of the European dream elevated the post-colonial problem to an overarching civilizational battlefield. The most recent political collapse of the Middle East and the Maghreb as a result of the Iraq War and the Arab Spring and the consequent lawlessness that ensued all around the region found very receptive ground in this civilizational battlefield, turning political expressions into cultural ones. Consequently, what was made especially dramatic was the revelation that the Arab world, at least in its Mediterranean terrain, remains internal to Europe, recasting in a modern mirror aspects of the medieval world and doing so in ways that show the survival of the sort of non-nationalist or pre-national imaginary that has remained persistent through colonization. The post-colonial populations born and raised in Europe's colonial states, in addition to new immigrant flows that came to rest upon the same structures and spaces as part of this internal condition, were consolidated in this respect across borders within Europe. Borderless Europe came to establish recognizably internal borders on the markings of what was considered to be culturally non-European in its very midst. And that is a long history. Dismissed and disaffected, large masses of people, many of whom were actually citizens or legal residents, turned to practices and beliefs that were demonstrably anti-European and hearkened back to formations of a cultural nature, I put this obviously in big quotation marks, that are imagined to precede colonization and are foregrounded as antidotes of post-coloniality. They're imagined to be. I'm not suggesting that they are. This is how we should account for what has been called the resurgence of religion and the subsequent civilizational war in the name of apocalyptic faith presumed to override politics. Last, condition five. The failure of secularism of laicite is due not to the alleged intrinsic exclusion that secular mentalities impose, because if they're true to their name, secular practices are tantamount to democratic practices. Because they're not, but they're not true to their name. Rather, the failure is due to the institutionalized ethno-culturalist exclusions that buttress secularist institutions in European countries. I've made a big difference between the secular and the secularist, and this is on which this is based. Secularism as institutional ideology that veils and whitewashes racism and ethnocultural division, which is always, of course, linked to class division, but it's not reducible to that, provoked the greatest damage against the democratic demands of a bona fide secular sociality. Religion thus becomes a convenient weapon against these institutional markers of exclusion, exploitation, and oppression. It is not a return to tradition or what have you. All that is but ideological dressing, necessary to drive the point home, but no more than that. And in fact, in this respect, perfectly deceiving and deceptive. Notice also in this respect the failure of late capitalist consumerism which was presumed to produce the flattening of differences, cultural, ethnic, racial, as massive numbers of youths abandoned the techno-economic palliatives offered to them as commodities and turned to presume to be spiritual modes of liberation. To what extent these modes, too, are undoubtedly exploitive and oppressive should concern us, but cannot cover over for the legitimate causes that force these youths to move from one mode of collective illusion to another. This also marks the need, I conclude here, this also marks the need to develop forms of left governmentality, for this situation is also part of the failure of the left to handle it. And as long as the left continues to be implicated in what are liberal fancies of multiculturalism and identity politics, it will remain disarmed versus the upsurge of 
anti-European or anti-Western sentiment, even though such sentiment is thoroughly justified historically. Thank you. Uh, right, I'll, I'll speak from sitting down. If you can hear the mic, that'll, that'll work well. Um, well, it's, it's a great uh, pleasure to be invited to this conference, um, though speaking eighth on two panels of four compressed into the time that we've had does present certain challenges. So as people have been going along, I've been kind of reworking the ideas that I shaped this morning, and the result is, the the result is something, something a little uneasy. Um, but it's almost a kind of a comment, an extended comment, I think. Uh, what I was struck with at the beginning is the way in which both Shaler and Bernard chose to position us and position the debate today. On the one hand, we have the human catastrophe of the refugee crisis, the drowned bodies, um, the suffering, uh, the dislocation, and the limbo. And on the other hand, we have this, the, the figures that, that uh, Shayla and then Alex also took up, the astonishingly small scale relative to the total population of Europe. There's something indignant, indignant about this juxtaposition of two to 500 million. And then to complete the triangle, we have this, the diagnosis of a total failure of policy. Now, this juxtaposition was, of course, rhetorical and rightly designed to emphasize the need for urgent action. But it, to me, begs the question, and perhaps this is my sort of non-normative historian soul coming through, of simply why is no action being taken? What if the failure to act reflects the fact that the refugee problem is not the small matter that the juxtaposition of 500 million to 2 million suggests? Maybe the total failure of policy points to a very big problem or set of problems, which is what causes such a panic. Now, I'm aware also, after listening to Stefanos' brilliant talk, of the, the danger of, as it were, succumbing to that panic, which is clearly out there, but I'm going to persevere. Daniel suggested the image of haemophilia um, as, as it were, the thing that really caught to cause us problem, not the flow, and I like that, but for the fact that haemophilia is a structural genetic condition. And I'm tempted to say that the situation is more as though we're dealing with a continent asked to respond to a small but acute problem shortly after facing a rather unexpected diagnosis of early-onset dementia. Except that this is, in fact, a self-incurred dementia, if you like. So I want to slide away from the biologistic language, but you see what I'm trying to get at. They didn't, we, no, we haven't lived with this always. There's something bad suddenly happened. And this is perhaps the role of the historian sometimes to say this, that we have never been in a place quite like this before. Now, if you, of course, if you take historicity at all seriously, this is always the case. We don't famously ever get to be in the same river twice, but I mean it in a non-trivial sense. We may be witnessing something like a comprehensive rupture, which is why I think critical theory struggles to grasp uh, this crisis. And the earliest draft of the paper written late last night was really a disquisition about how I don't think Foucault's categories of governmentality will allow us to grasp it. I've ended up somewhere very different. Clearly, to induce this kind of panic, it needs not just the refugee crisis alone, but the refugee crisis piled on top of a series of unhingings, I would argue, since 2007 at the very least, which we struggle, have all struggled, are still struggling to get the measure of. This is where I'm aware, I'm acutely aware, that I might be falling into that kind of holistic talk of panic that Stefanos described for us so brilliantly. But if you take this alarmist reading seriously, you in fact probably need to go back not to 2007-8, but at least to 2003, and the catastrophic consequences of the illegal, illegitimate, and unsuccessful, that may be perhaps the most important thing for the question of point of view of order, unsuccessful war launched by the US and the coalition of the willing, precisely in the region out of which the migrants are now flowing. And it doesn't seem to me, we've said this quite loudly enough this afternoon, the flow of migrants is not just from the civil war in Syria, but Iraq and Afghanistan as well. Of course, there have been some other really big moments of European crisis, the 1970s and the 1930s, if we highlight those of the 20th century. And there are aspects of the present crisis, starting with the unhinging of the financial system, which structures, I would suggest, all that follows and sets limits to action. There are aspects of the massive incoherence of governance in the wake of that crisis that do seem to me to resemble the 1930s and put me in mind of the narrative of the disintegration of the state offered, for instance, by Franz Neumann in his monumental account of the Third Reich, Behemoth. But the problem from our point of view, the discontinuity between then and now, is that the theorists of capitalist crisis and fascism in the 30s set themselves to explaining hyperactive, hyperviolent regimes, whereas our problem is the opposite, to explain disorder barely contained by the painful passivity and self-imposed restraint of liberal states. 
To understand order and restraint, we turn, of course, to the accounts of neoliberalism in the 1970s, the logics of discipline, and so on. And there have been 30 years of critical theory directed at those, starting with the Foucault text that so many of us has devoted so many productive hours to this year. And the basic diagnosis, however, we all agree on with regard to the refugee and migrant problem is the one that was laid out for us and has been repeatedly come back to, but was laid out for us by Shaler. Under conditions of globality, there's a tension between proliferating human rights discourses, the massive fact of global inequality, rich country labor market imperatives, and national welfare states underpinned by populist democracies. And as Stefano stressed, once we have recognized this profound tension going back at least to the mid-20th century, but in the U.S., of course, back to the nativist moment of the 1890s, it really isn't helpful for anything other than rhetorical purposes to tell a story in which there was once a Europe of human rights that has since fallen from grace. It was always riven with contradictions. In its guest worker programs, it did not even manage to live up to its own cynicism, I would argue. Um, they didn't even have the nerve to block family reunification, whilst the apartheid was really what they always had in mind. They couldn't pull it off in either direction. Liberalism cross-cut with racism, a racial or ethnic structuring cross-cut by an involuntary liberal knee-jerk. It was always an extremely uncertain balance. The very most, I think, one could say is that Europe has had a human rights aspiration with all that aspiration implies. It's a bit like young men who watch videos of high-end cars on YouTube or young women who enjoy high fashion magazines. It's real enough as desire, it's, but it's lived as a very conflicted reality. And it's not at all obvious, given their underlying inadequacies, that it would even be a terribly good thing for them to go after the full dream. Uh, the question is, what makes this tension, however, bearable? Three things, I would argue. First of all, some prospect of economic growth. Secondly, the ability to regulate the volume, speed, and predictability of the flow and of, of newcomers, of incomers, as it were. And then thirdly, the question of whether or not the flow seems to reflect some basic disruption of the international order. And I would agree very much that guest workers mean something very different than post-colonial migrants. And Yugoslavia, the huge problem that Germany faced in the 1990s, is very different than the meltdown of the Middle East. So what I'm going to suggest briefly in the time that I'm going to take is that the current situation is an unprecedented crisis in that those three factors that made the tensions inherent within liberal governmentality with regard to this basic quadrilateral of, of uh, human rights, uh, globalization, national wealth and states and labor markets, that the factors that made that tension bearable have all been suddenly thrown into question. First of all, the promise of growth. Now, of course, Europe is large and rich and safe relative to Afghanistan or Syria, Syria now. And individual refugees and migrants can expect to improve their lives by moving. But that's a very low bar to apply. For the Europeans as a whole, certainly outside Germany and some other favored North European states, this is not any longer, obviously, an economic dream. The promise of economic growth is slipping away. As in the U.S., we're in fact facing something unprecedented, a factoid that we're all familiar with with the U.S. case, but is reflected to a degree also in Europe, namely a radical dissociation between the basic biopolitical variables. In other words, individual experience, the aggregate demography, and aggregate economic growth. They simply no longer go hand in hand. In the same way as national economic experience is separated in the U.S. since the mid-1970s from median uh, household medium individual incomes, something similar, slightly less radical, but nevertheless dramatic is happening in Europe as well. And this goes beyond the stagflation of the 70s, because inflation would at least eat up the debt. What we're instead facing is a deflationary trap, which we've been in essentially for eight years. And Europe right now is haunted by 22 million unemployed. Now, 22 million is nearly exactly the population of Syria before the Great Killing began. Um, youth unemployment that Shaler referenced is worse, I think, than the data that, that Shaler gave you. Um, it's 22% for young people across all of the Eurozone. It's 45% in Greece, 45%, just under half of all young people without work. Now, the obvious solution is some kind of Keynesian stimulus, but that's where we really begin, I think, to dig into the historic disaster that we're facing, namely the massively uh, tightly contained and imposed system of austerity that uh, strangles economic debate. And the point again to make is that this is not the fresh, uh, ruddy cheat promising revolutionary neoliberalism of the 1970s. It doesn't offer that the promises that used to attach to it. It is more like a zombie version. It's like the German economic miracle replayed as tragedy, perhaps not yet as fast, but we may be heading in that direction, a policy pursued in the face of its catastrophic failure, offset by a monetary policy that cannot but increase inequality, but does a little bit, if you like, to hide the full effects 
of the disastrous policy that the German finance ministry has been so consistently pushing. Uh, an economy, in other words, in a kind of half-life uh, uh, on a monetary life support system. So, second point. Fine, you say Europe's economy is bad, but there are refugees everywhere. There are other much poorer countries which cope, Lebanon being the most dramatic example in our context, perhaps. And don't invoke history. Everyone has history. Alex alluded to Australia, and that is a country, after all, with a hundred years of highly racialized immigration history as well, the defense of a white man's country, its overwhelming priority. And that move, I think, to reject history that Alex made so forcefully is absolutely fine and justified in its own right. It's a powerful rhetoric of universality that says we can put Kenya, Australia, and Macedonia in the same uh, box analytically and judge them by the same standards. But it should be understood, that move, for what it is. It belongs amongst the rhetoric, not just of bureaucracy, but of action and politics. It's not a move, I think, that encourages critical differentiation and understanding. What one is doing is essentially refusing and insisting upon refusing the excuse of geopolitical and cultural fault lines. But if we want to do more than flay the European elite for their palpable failure to rise to the occasion, we do, I think, have to go back to that history, even if it so easily becomes either a numbing cliché or a source of exaggerated panic, either, as it were, the Tukula problem, where history is endlessly invoked, or the Stephanos problem, where we're constantly talking ourselves into some sort of uh, Financial Times, Gideon Rachman kind of advent of 1914 all over again. But if we take this problem of giving the EU a history seriously, then we cannot but trace it back to the Thirty Years' War in Westphalia, and then from on from there in more recent history to the German problem, too big for Europe, too small for the world. But what I would argue about the crisis is that it reveals that this Eurocentric framing of the history of the European state system is itself insufficient. It isn't, in fact, that we have too much history and we're burdened by too much of it, but we've got too little history in mind. And I don't mean initially to gesture to empire, which is the point that you very productively put on the table. I would argue that the source to understand our most immediate problem is, in fact, the, 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 the problem that we need to widen our horizons to encompass um, is much closer to home. What is at stake here is a trajectory that leads forward not from 1648, but leads forward from 1683. Why 1683? Why this obscure reference? Because that's the moment in which a coalition of Central European states and the Holy Roman Empire, led by a Polish general, stopped the last great conquering Ottoman army on its way to Vienna. Now, that may seem absurdly deep in history, but it's on that kind of scale, I think, that the transformation in Turkey's position has to be judged. We habitually just knee-jerk to 1648, why not 1683, as an absolutely major fault line. It's that moment, that victory of the West, that defeat for the Ottoman Empire, it's from that moment onwards that we move into the world that Daniel described, in which, as it were, the Ottoman Empire is our problem that we manage uh, when we make concessions and we worry about the declining health of the sick man of Europe. It was throughout, it should be recognized, and this marks Turkey's history, a history of violent biopolitical social engineering. Back to the early 19th century formations of the Christian new nation states, Serbia and Greece, which unleashed huge and undocumented flows of Muslim refugees retreating from the empire in the Balkans back uh, into the Ottoman homelands, culminating not in the notorious sykes picot agreement of 1916, but far more insignificantly for us in the robust and violent reassertion of Turkey as a potent nation state in 1923 at Laozan. And that, I think, is a really crucial date for us. Um, a, because the Turkish nation state at that moment is born in a gigantic refugee crisis, the forced population exchange between Turkey and Greece. Um, but also because what this means is that with this consolidation, um, we, we achieve one of the anchoring elements in the international system which is hugely underestimated in its significance in the 20th century. That is the robust and for the first half of the 20th century, neutral Turkish nation-state, which forms a seal between European history and European affairs and the Middle East. That's what makes this flow right now under shock of Merkel's direct diplomacy with Erdogan, such a radical historical departure. Before 45, Turkey's neutrality shielded the British Empire in World War II, absolutely crucial for the globality or lack of globality of World War II. In the Cold War, it formed the indispensable seal between the frozen Cold War, the cold Cold War in Europe, and the hot wars of the Middle East. Another way of defining Turkey's crucial sealing role is in terms of its memberships. In NATO, not in the EU, not for, as it were, most of the post-war period, considered as a Middle Eastern actor either. Somehow a kind of uh, a neutralized space uh, in, the, in the middle of the zone. 
And the, so I would argue that the end of the Ottoman Empire and the erection of the Turkish nation state does played a crucial part in what you might describe of, as the provincialization of Europe, of Western Europe, that is, uh, in the 20th century. And it's that seal that has collapsed under the double pressure, first of all, of the shocks of 2003, then you might call it the temptation of the Arab Spring and the reawakening of an Ottomanist, Ottomanist ambition on Turkey's part. Uh, Turkey was by no means merely a passive victim of the crisis that unfolds since 2011 in Syria. But that, I think, um, is the second part of this puzzle as to why this current crisis is unique, because one of the absolutely central stabilizing structuring elements that define Europe as being Europe and separate from certain other bits of the world, this Turkish uh, problem has been really fundamentally thrown into question. Then, finally, there's a, 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 wider, a, a wider point, um, because... To say the Middle East, Syria, was not Europe's problem is, of course, to beg the question of whose problem it was. And I think even saying that is, in fact, hard to understand from the point of view of the average American, the educated New York Times reader, because the Middle East has for so long, for the second half of the 20th century, occupied this massively outside space in American policy discourse. It's, of course, also hard to understand against the backdrop of the deep history of European imperialism, which, however, very abruptly comes to an end in 1956. But after that, for half a century, after that, the withdrawal of Europe was comprehensive. And this, I think, points to the third unprecedented and profoundly unsettling shock um, that sets up the current crisis, which is the question that Alexander asked um, in a normative, demanding way, but I would pose as a historic problem, which is where is the U.S. in the Syrian refugee crisis? Because if the Middle East wasn't Europe's, it was America's. And to discover now it's Europe's and not America's is deeply, deeply uh, uh, problematic. This question is reverberating through Europe right now. If you read smart commentators in, in Germany like Bernd Ulrich at the site, this is his constant harping, his harping point. Europe... Europe's history, and this is a structural feature, of course, since the early 20th century, is transatlantic history, and thoroughly so. Everything has a geometry that is at least triangular. In the 1956, in the Suez Crisis, it was precisely the discovery of their subordinate position in a geometry that helped push France and Britain finally to retreat from the Middle East. Since 2008, the Eurozone crisis, the money market, and the Fed are the crucial triangle. Since 2013, it's slightly more complicated. It's the Ukraine, Europe, Russia, and the United States. And the shock of the Arab Spring and Syria in particular is the realization that with the US pulling back, it turns out that in geopolitical terms, Europe is more, not less exposed to blow black from the utter fiasco of Western policy in the Middle East since 2003 than the United States. Germans rapidly turn this into a story of guilt. We're suffering from the chaos created by the bad uh, Americans. Uh, that entire rhetoric of the moment of 2003, I think, requires unpicking an exploration, certainly from the point of view with somebody with my accent, that um, that kind of assignment of blame doesn't come quite so easily. In these respects, I think we can argue, these three respects, that the current situation is unprecedented. We have an ongoing, and as far as the frontline states in Italy and Greece are concerned, fundamentally unresolved economic crisis, which they cannot even pretend to have the national sovereignty to address. We have what appears to be a profound shift in U.S. engagement, or rather disengagement. Real or not, the fear is there. And thirdly, we have a highly complex and very immediate crisis on Europe's doorstep, the violence and comprehensiveness of which place it amongst the most serious that we have ever seen, uh, certainly even by the high bar set in the 20th century. What is happening in Syria right now registers on every chart of large-scale killing. All of this, I think, has stripped away the compromises that made the ordinary conflicts that haunt the liberal box of globalization, human rights, national welfare states, and capitalist labor markets um, uh, manageable. All of this, this sudden shift in these three parameters makes that familiar problem that we've been living with for decades suddenly unmanageable. Now these remarks are not of course an apology for Europe's failure. It's shameful that the desperate bedraggled mouse of the migrants should be scaring the European elephant. But if we want to understand both why polities have failed to respond and why, frankly, our critical theories have struggled to respond as well, I think we need to understand what the refugees from Syria actually are seen to mean and what situation they're entering into. Trade-offs that were once manageable appear very differently when we're dealing not just with an inconsistent and incoherent liberalism, but one that fails in its most bio central biopolitical role of securing growth. For theory to criticize liberalism and neo neoliberalism was one thing. To come to terms, and I mean this seriously, to come to terms with its spectacular failure 
and its life beyond death. How we are going to live amongst its ruins is another a challenge I think we haven't yet risen to. Similar comments apply, I think, to the vanishing spectre and perhaps the retreating reality of American power. I think we're only beginning to come to terms. This would be my suggestion of how we think about the refugee crisis. We're only beginning to come to terms with the degree to which critical theory, much along with much other thinking of the 20th century in Europe, centred in a privileged way in Europe itself, was not so much a critical engagement with as a reflection of Europe's provincialisation. Thank you. So you don't think that building a wall and getting Mexico to pay for it would be a solution? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's uh, going to be a real challenge to try to moderate this uh, discussion. And uh, we have planned a plenary discussion after this session, correct? So what we are going to do maybe is just, uh, let me just remind uh, the listeners uh, very briefly of uh, the various points because I'm myself very provoked and have quite a bit to say about the concept of crisis and critical theory, but we'll keep that to the plenary, uh, plenary uh, session. Uh, now, it, Daniel reminded us um, of this extremely important issue of deportation and expulsion, which remains quite invisible, both in the scholarship and in terms of even just how this practice is organized. We know that under the Obama administration, also the number of deportations has increased record record numbers. Uh, but there is a relationship between deportation and asylum in that at its most banal level, and one can say much about it, those who are denied asylum need to be deported. Now there are, uh, you know, so the, the denial of the asylum application means that the person no longer has the right to stay on that territory. Uh, throughout Europe, strange subterfuges in this respect take place. For me, one of the most interesting is the civil society response in the Netherlands, which has generations of asylum seekers whose applications have been denied, and the word here is dulden, uh, just simply uh, patience or something. They, they go under. Now, uh, another way in which the problem of deportation uh, relates to the broader issues that we are discussing, and this is the very, very uh, uh, important and I think terrible conversation that is going on about the denationalization of terrorists. Uh, you may know that the French National Assembly rejected this, but we have heard that in the UK this is shrouded in something of a mystery. So deportation is the obverse side, if you want, of, um, of uh, entry. Now there is an interesting tension between Turkula's presentation, she called it an imminent critique of Europe's self-understanding of assuring social solidarity and cosmopolitan projects through market unification and the kind of critique and uh, the justifiable and anal you know, negative analysis provided by both Status and, and Adam, which I think Turkey would agree with, but uh, she's also maybe project, uh, presenting Europe's own failed dream about itself, which oddly and poignantly enough, so many refugees still buy into. I mean, one of the questions is, when are they going to you know, give up this dream of, uh, of Europe? Of course, there isn't much, uh, there isn't much, um, uh, much uh, uh, choice here. Um, there is a great deal more to be said, but why don't we just open it to the questions and maybe come back to the issue of left governmentality, uh, sort of, you know, Adam's parallelogram of human rights, liberalization, national sovereignty and capital at the larger discussion, because otherwise the audience may not have a... So, yes, please, go ahead. People aren't leaving Syria because they're looking for a dream. They want to be able to eat, 
They went, want to be able to stand in line and get bread without having beer on the top down. And they want to send their kids to school. You know, these, they want to be able to speak their opinion in public without being arrested and tortured. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. Um, my name is Shazia Rafi. I'm former Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action. I worked with several European legislatures and some origin countries um, on the issue of migration and assimilation uh, through a series of workshops. I've not heard that issue mentioned by all of you in um, really in a real political context, because that's what the politicians tend to be running their elections on um, and taking their positions, uh, you know, whether the reason they're against migration is because the migrants are not assimilating enough or the opposite. Um, would anybody well, of course, like you, also, you have a, an issue of three generations of citizens who are not assimilated enough. So it's a, it's a deep conflation of a problem. I, I think this goes back to you know, the larger context of this. I mean, it really strikes me that the, the, the terrorism crisis, and, and it's, it's true in this country in a lesser form. I mean, I, I was just riding down on the train with my daughter who was here before, who went to Cambridge Ringe and Latin High School with the kid Sarnayev, who actually mm -hmm. was the, the marathon bombing. The kid was, um, you know, well, relatively well assimilated apparently through high school and then became deeply alienated and led astray by his brother and of course the Times has just had an interesting piece about how, much, how many brothers are in this but it just strikes me that there's this deep pervasive alienation problem and that it manifests itself in this particular ideology now but in a previous generation I just have the feeling that it would manifest itself in a different way maybe as anarchism or you know as it did in 1919 in, in this country in a previous generation so I, I don't. I never quite understand the the discussion of the lack of assimilation as an immigrant problem because it, it's a post-colonial problem. It's a multi-generational problem in France. It just strikes me that it's much more complicated than a, than a migration problem, but it gets captured that way. Yeah. Alex. So this is an extremely interesting panel. I want to ask a question based on what Dan said to the other three panelists because he. Maybe this is just uh, foolish lawyer talk, um, but uh, there was a little bit of optimism that the, the jurisprudence of the, of the courts, the EU courts and the, and the European courts, that could be used to mediate some of the tensions. And I didn't hear a discussion of this from the others, and I wonder whether you think actually, as the EU project is a scam and as it's failing, or does it actually, do the legal norms here provide some counterbalance to that, or is that part of the failure as well. Can I just add, I think, uh, thank you for asking that, and, and I want to just add to it what I meant also was that it's, it is quite striking, and I know Alex sees this too, that certain things in Europe are just off the table, that are on the table in the United States, and in fact have been done in the United States in, this, in, in some of the aftermath of uh, September 11th, for example, just couldn't happen because of these structures, so th that's what I was thinking about. Patrick Hale? Yes, in fact, maybe my question is more for Alex, based on the panel, uh, because I think what the panel shows, the four speakers, is that there was a gap between different levels of sovereignty and alliance, the European Union dealing with the economy, the nation states trying to keep sovereignty through denaturalization, for example, and then the political and historical alliance, which are transatlantic, and that doesn't go together. And for example, one of, I think from a European perspective, the fact that the EU could not ask to America, to Saudi Arabia, an international conference, that the EU are, is only asked to do the humanitarian part of, the, of, of, of what's happening, and not, is not asked to be part of the negotiation with uh, Syria and Russia in the future of, of, of the region, I think that plays a role in uh, the resistance of some European to be only the place for you, the humanitarian uh, answer to the crisis. And I wonder if, at the knowledge of Alex, there was at the UNHCR level this at an attempt, for example, to organize an international conference. Of course, Avion is a bad memory of, for everybody, but a kind of conference that could have dealt 
internationally and not an, only at the European level uh, to, to, to fill this gap. Uh, whoever wants to answer. Adam, do you want to? Um, I, maybe I'll try. Um, I, I wouldn't want anything that I've said to suggest that I thought that the EU was merely a, a scam. We both said we both said hostile things. I'll, I'll let you claim the scam element, um, but I think we have to find a language. I mean, I, I, I think it's really also a methodological question, isn't it, for a conversation like this? Because this room includes, as it were, strongly normatively minded uh, colleagues, uh, practitioners, and um, um, people engaged in a project which is basically straightforwardly explanatory. And mediating between those is obviously notoriously difficult. In some sense, it is the problem of critical theory. And I think we've had a variety of different perspectives. I mean, I like Tuku's kind of, it's a kind of classic Habermasian move. Like, they've made all these promises. They've given all these hostages to fortune. Well, let's call them on all of them like, and see whether they mean any of them seriously. And clearly, the courts are the privileged site for that kind of liberal politics. Um, when um, the German guest worker program was in full swing, that's not how the politics of migration was done. It was done by corporatism. Right? So the German trade unions would test whether the employers were serious about the bargain that really mattered to them most by literally bargaining about the ethnic origin, the cultural background, the health status of migrants that were brought in to work in factories, say VW, for instance, famously recruited principally from Italy for a long time, as a result of a bargain with Ige Metal. So... And both of those I would take of as being, as it were, probing strategies in which people mobilize resources that are there, collective bargaining instruments on the one hand, or the courts in the current, under the current regime, which are clearly the absolutely privileged sites, which is why I take Shayla's politics, but arts politics to a large extent, to be centered precisely on that arena, because it's a place where you can call liberalism on promises it's clearly made. Um, and that, that, is, that is crucial. That and this goes to the, the question asked from over here, as it were, is there an arena, and that maybe is the, the link here, that the law gives you an arena in which you can make a certain sort of claim, and then you can push on from there and see how far it actually goes. Questions of practice and implementation come up. Exactly as you're saying, there is no arena uh, in which, as it were, the Europeans could simply say, look, in fact, this is, this is very much our problem, and really we should be negotiating. In fact, Saudi, you in fact have interest in relations with us too. I and mean, if we collectively organized ourselves, we would have enormous weight in dealing with the Saudis. Um, you'd think of far more than the Americans, because we buy their oil more than the Americans do. Um, and, but what we've seen, of course, over the course of this crisis is the reverse, right? A self-subversion of European uh, aspirations to foreign policy. And this is where the Ukraine would come in, where the entire thing has been driven by unilateral negotiation headed by Merkel with Russia, but wants to have nothing to do with Brussels. And Brussels is left with the odious sanctions regime program, uh, which the Germans can politically move past. So, as it were, there is there a failure to understand, I think, or perhaps a deliberate backing away from the logic of building fora, of building platforms on which one might then exercise leverage. Mm -hmm. Just very quickly, I, 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 just to... Jean, uh, uh, status has a response. Yeah, I mean, you, uh, because I, I think this is actually a very important challenge. Uh, um, and I know I've painted a really bleak picture uh, and you know I'm actually an optimist uh, you know sort of by makeup it's n um, I, I'm not foreclosing the, the fact that legal framework can be used to address this problem uh, I'm just there are two things one I think there's a serious credibility deficit in the institutions of Europe to handle things at all levels and that itself is symptomatic of what I've been arguing for a while now it's kind of it seems that it's sort of obvious. As long as the European Union really is a matter of, of sort of financial interests, all of the institutions that we call, broadly speaking, political, will lose in their attempts to address issues, whether they are in terms of international you know, politics or in terms of rights in courts. I mean, while there's still, even in these conditions, the you know the banks and the, and the and the and the you know financial elites still believe in austerity measures as a solution to the economic problem, while you know saying you know we're going to benefit from the labor of these people you know who are you know it's just that's my problem is that, that 
so of course I'm not foreclosing it, but I'm, I'm, I don't know how it will work. I mean, you, you know, ultimately, I would love to see it actually work. Uh, is this can, is this on? Yeah, yeah. Go oh, ahead. You can hear. Gene Con. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Is the mic on? Yeah, it's on. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Sure. I can't hear. You can hear. That's good. Um, yeah, you know, I actually, I think there's a deeper tension between Turkey's presentation. Oh, we can't hear you. I think there's a deeper tension between uh, Turku's presentation and Stathis's presentation, and it's not just about the, um, you know, assessment. Um, I guess for me the problem is that I'm not sure if I buy the imminent critique uh, strategy. I, th I would say nice try, no cigar, because I don't think the European Union project was cosmopolitan. I mean, it was, if you're thinking of Europe vis-a-vis -vis the nation state, that's a step. But you could also say, you know, you could see it as quasi-federal, as United States cosmopolitan, internally, I don't think we would say that today. So I'm not convinced about that. And if it's not, if it wasn't, then it's not an imminent critique. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that, um, you know, I mean, and I'm just going to go out on a limb here. It's not, I'm not saying what I, what I believe, I'm just throwing out a thought, which is a dark thought. So... I mean, the mobility of labor. You know, the old Marxists, some of us were once, are, some of us are now old and we used to be Marxists, let's put it that way. Um, you know, I mean, that's what we're talking about. The, Seth has said it, labor is a commodity. It's, it's a pure mobility. Of course, Karl Polanyi was not the first to say that this is a nightmare. It sounds like primitive accumulation all over again. So is the mobility and commodification of labor such a, is this a utopia? I'm not convinced. Now, if you want to use that as a stand-in for open borders, Fine, but I'm but I'm not convinced um, that this is such a uh, such a such a positive thing. There's always been migration, yes, but so it brings me to Adam's question, which is uh, I, I don't I'm not sure I understood what he said, but I'm really really worried about it because I do believe that all of this is about a much much deeper phenomenon. Although I didn't quite figure out what you said the deeper phenomenon is. That was my problem. I mean, in a way, this aust with the auster austerity. Um, politics are totally baffling. I mean, that, they're not idiots in, in, the, in the heads of state in Europe, so they know it's failed. Then if you know it, they know it. So in a sense, what is going on? So what is the, it's really bizarre, actually. So, so the deeper, what is the deeper problem? How can we actually put our finger on this and address this? Because if we don't, I mean, obviously it's the push. Why are people leaving? That's one aspect. I don't mean just a war zone, because you're talking about economic migrants, right? So, I mean, in a sense, there's something that I think we're not getting at. And, um, uh, but I do think you're right. It's a much deeper problem. And um, I'd like to have, maybe you could clarify a little bit of what you meant by it, because I, I just, maybe I just tuned out because it was so hot. But um, <laughs> tell me what it is, so I can get really worried. Um, yes, of, of course. I mean, I think one should respond, but we are sort of sliding into the general... Dis no, no, sure. The, the general... Di maybe... Yeah. Can we do that? Can we take your question? And then some of the other questions... Yes, yes, you get the response after the break. Because otherwise... No, no, please. Please. Okay, Adam, go ahead. I should respond to you. Yeah, if you want to. So, I mean, I, I, I'm tempted to say that the problem is that the world isn't like Stathis says it is. In other words, I think we're actually facing an irrationality which is not reducible to the particular interests of capital in any straightforward sense. And that may, in fact, be the, the puzzle, that there's a kind of dissociation here which is quite radical. Uh, and the other element that I was pointing towards as, as truly new is this is this reconfiguration of the geopolitics of Europe's immediate near abroad and of America's position, which I think is still, we're moving towards. But that Western Asian crisis, as Halliday used to describe it, I think is a new phenomenon and, and on the arc I'm sketching out should stand as at least as pivotal as something like 1648, in which case this zone of the world is experiencing an upheaval um, that really moves the parameters. So those things taken together, precisely the kind of dark impenetrability of the logic of policy with regard to capital accumulation and this, let's not call it the return of geopolitics, but this unhinging of the geopolitical frame that was always there, those are the two. Yeah, so um, the historical documents you know during the founding sort of stages of the forerunner organizations of the Euro of what is now the European Union are permeated 
by this on its face universalistic discourse of opposition to the nation state. That's not just about let's make our continent great, you know, let's make ourselves rich, but also about kind of dismantling some of, you know, the destructive impulses of the nation state by means of a superior and more universalist mode of political organization. Um, Obviously, you know, the people who espoused those ideologies were themselves complicit, you know, in all sorts of, you know, the colonial ventures of their, you know, respective states and so on. Um, so I don't think that we should take their discourse, you know, at, at face value or without criticism. But that sort of, you know, um, I think that does distinguish um, the European project, sort of at least the, the, the aspirations at the root of it um, from other sort of coming together uh, federations. Um, and I think that that logic is also imminent within some of the strongest norms that define the European Union's constitutional system. For example, the principle of non-discrimination on the basis of nationality. Now the member states have chosen to kind of couch that within a citizenship framework from the 1990s onwards that gives rise to discriminatory consequences, right? The non-discrimination principle actually becomes a principle on the way, basis of which one discriminates between EU citizens um, and third country nationals. Um, and there's a lot of sort of underutilized potential to it that the, uh, that the Court of Justice of the European Union has also not stepped up um, to use. But I think that that, you know, I think that that principle is there, and I think that, sure, we can condemn the European Union on the basis of our own progressive principles, but we can also condemn it on the basis of its own principles, or at least make an effort to hold it up to those principles. May I say one thing about labor? Because part of your question, you, had, you talked about the movement of labor, and as a sort of... Um, let's say, ripening former red diaper baby myself, I guess I could, I, I might want to say that there is a difference, <laughs> there is a difference between um, labor, the, you know, the movement of labor to places in which the exploitation of that labor is fully unrestrained by rights protections. Therefore, I think it's very important to examine the, the functioning of those rights protections. And I think about cases like the Zambrano case and other things that have been happening in Europe really do make a difference in the fungibility and the exploitability of those labor movements. Okay, let's end this session. I see you, I recognize yeah, you. Right How about if you become... I just okay, fine, go ahead. I just want somebody to, to comment on something I have not heard since I came this morning. Tell me, what, do, what role do religion and race play into that? Okay, why don't we take this as one of the opening questions for the general discussion, because people want to move. I want to use the restroom, and we need to, we need to break for a few minutes, okay? Ten minutes and we come back and we have this question about religion and race on the table, okay? Why don't you come have a seat, come close. Uh, so what we would like to try and do is just have a kind of a closing conversation uh, and, uh, and I'll open it very quickly but then hopefully we can kind of have a conversation among uh, everyone here and the participants and uh, everyone who's here because we have such a rich group together and then uh, Shayla will give us some closing thoughts uh, before we break for a small reception at six. So uh, first of all we do have one outstanding issue uh, from the last question that was asked that we need to incorporate and bring on the table which has to do with race and religion uh, and the role of race and religion which is enormous here and of course um, uh, Adam uh, spoke and uh, about some of the issues uh, and status as well and so uh, we need to keep those on the table. Um, there were two other things that I wanted to I suppose put on the table. The, the first relates to Adam's third point um, uh, which has to do with the role of the United States. Now of course here we are we are at the Maison Francaise but it's completely by accident it's just because Shawnee Pierre is, is a great director of the Maison Francaise and so um, it's a great venue. And we're also supported by the Columbia Global Centers Paris and, we're, and by the European Institute. But 
we could very well be at, at any other building uh, on Columbia. We could be at the law school, which would have been, you know, fine. And, and of course, it would have been less European, right? Um, uh, now, that raises a, a question, which is, how, 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 have we, how do we understand this, uh, this deep refusal in the United States to deal with this refugee crisis and the fact that we only are admitting 10,000 refugees, which is just unimaginable, uh, unthinkable uh, in terms of uh, our response in this country. And I don't think that, you know, it, it's, it, it feels intractable in this country right now, uh, in part because of the political situation and the election, in part because this whole issue is so tied to terrorism uh, in the United States that, it's that it feels intractable. But how is it that we can, in some sense, divorce ourselves from or ignore or simply say, it's intractable here, let's think about what Europe can do, right? That move, that move is just, is unacceptable. But it's, but it, then you have to put that, the, Syrian refugee crisis in the context of a United States which under the Obama administration has been the greatest detainer of uh, refugees coming from uh, the South, from Mexico, from uh, Latin America uh, in history. So basically the detention camps that the Obama administration has built or has had the American, that, that has had private prisons build, private correctional uh, organizations build in Texas are huge and we Shayla and I have been uh, addressing that issue talking about it in, in relationship with a lot of what's going on at the law school right now which uh, there's a great clinic that's trying to address some of these issues but um, it's a it's a larger systemic problem in the United States that I think we need to also have on the table as a as a as a point of reference and as a foil because it doesn't seem to me as if we can really think about the European response when we are so paralyzed here in this country um, and completely non-responsive. Okay, that's one thing. And then the second thing I think we need to uh, think about, or the third thing, because we have race and religion and we have the United States, and the third thing is really, uh, it's the critical theory piece, which I think is very challenging. And the question is this tension between continuing to play with play along with the myths and uh, uh, ideals and um, uh, rhetoric of Europe, right? And that was, well, of course, uh, what Turku was talking about, right? Uh, to continue to play with that and to play with it in part because there is a, an advantage of scale, I take it. That's really what draws us back into that kind of rhetorical move, I think, is the problem of scale. Because maybe if we've got, you know, two million, but it's out of 500, we can do something. Whereas if we then deconstruct that entity and take it apart and be honest or show up the lie, right? Uh, the Stathis' uh, intervention, show up the lie, then you end up losing the potential that the fictional and the myth allows us to imagine in Europe. And I think that tension is really at the heart of the difficulty and the ambiguity for a critical theoretic approach here. Uh, do you continue with these myths or do you even play along with them? And of course, we know that they're a myth. The, the market liberalism idea, which uh, you know, Turku, you're suggesting that we could draw on. Well, of course, we know that these notions of the market are entirely fictitious, constructed, and have always been delineated by boundaries, right? And it's the setting of the boundaries of the market that make the market possible, right? wow. the free market possible. It's the creating a space like the wheat pit at the Chicago Board of Trade as this, you know, totally constructed space of freedom within that pit, but completely 
constructed, regulated from the outside. And of course, what we have is a completely regulated, bordered, uh, policed, militarily policed uh, market within which we claim to have these uh, benefits of uh, free exchange. So I think that those are at least three points that I think we should put some pressure on and maybe what we could do now is open up the conversation and get responses and a conversation going. Uh, yes, and we have a mic somewhere that, uh, yes, Daniel. Well, I'll just start at rolling on the second question because I had wanted to speak more about this but I w didn't have the time to get into it. I mean, I think the tragedy in the United States is not that the problem is intractable. The, pro the tragedy is that it's tractable. I think this could easily have been done had the administration wanted to do it. I don't think that it required, it could have been done with congressional acquiescence, it could have been done around Congress. There are a lot of way, pathways to do it, but I think this is a pattern of this administration which has been, to my mind, a sort of Faustian bargain on the one hand and also a, a very judicious use of political capital for certain things. And I think with comprehensive immigration reform, that agenda fell to health care. Now, whatever you think about that, I think the president used the capital that, that he had and felt that he couldn't use more to, to get further on immigration. I think now the part of the bargain has, has been a sort of crackdown on immigration enforcement, which is very surprising for many of us who supported this administration coming in, but has been a reality, as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure it's... I mean, it's different in some of its aspects than what happened during the Bush administration. You don't see the factory raids. You, don't, you see different approaches, more of a sort of focus on people who committed crimes, for example, mm -hmm. more protection of children. Mm -hmm. But I think what happened here also was that the president went way out front on DACA and DAPA, is feeling a lot of heat at the Supreme Court and elsewhere about the challenges to that, and I think has just been very nervous about expending the political capital in this arena where there's also no constituency that's pushing as strongly for it as there might have been. So I don't think it's an intractable problem. I just think it's, it's pretty easy to explain, in, in my view, why it hasn't happened here. I do think it's shameful and tragic. Mm -hmm. It just seems, though, that in this election cycle, why don't we pass the mic, that in this election cycle, in the middle of it, it's, there's, a, there's a new dimension to it. It's no longer the Obama administration. It's something about what Donald Trump is saying. It's something about what the, you know, the debates are. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have Ray a... Anderson. Um, Bernard, you, uh, you opened by asking what is it that, um, that allows Americans to sit back and, uh, and ponder what Europeans should do. Um, and I, I kind of wonder if one couldn't also reverse the question and ask why it is what's led Europeans to collaborate in, in more than a decade of disastrous and terroristic American offensives in the Middle East and in some cases even spearhead their own initiatives in Libya, for instance, or in Mali, um, Central African Republic. Because it seems to me that's really the proximate um, cause of the latest crisis. It's not a sort of exogenous problem which somehow is washed up on European shores, but this, these waves of refugees right are the direct consequence of um, quite extraordinary series of military campaigns. Um, and so I wonder, it seems to me that's been rather absent from the, mm -hmm. from the discussion mm -hmm. we've had so far today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So we did touch a lot on 2003, but we viewed it as an American problem instead of, in, instead of trying to look at the symbiotics with, uh, um, with the Europeans' uh, partners, right? I, mean, I think... Um I think, I think the Europeans and the Americans and the commentators on European-American affairs are still working through, really, the, the fallout from 2003. And part of that is, as I suggested in my you know, rushed comments, this German discourse about abandonment. Right? This is, this is, this is, uh, there was a rather interesting conversation between Fischer and the Zeit editorial board, which I think is basically Ben Ulrich in this case. If you read German, it's this extraordinary sort of geopolitical... Uh, horizon that Fisher opens up, and uh, it has exactly that. So the question is: so you know, America screwed up and then abandoned us uh, to the consequences. To which Fisher says, yes, broadly speaking, well, I always thought it was a bad idea, uh, and obviously that doesn't count for all of Europe. And the East Europeans are amongst, after all, the coalition of willing and very, very prominent amongst the European Europeans. And one doesn't even have to start talking about the UK, which is clearly a key actor. Italy, and then of course the remarkable kind of démarche of Sarkozy's. Uh, activism, the sudden activism in 2011, which is so mysterious. So I think, as you know, Gray, I mean, I think this inability to actually arrive at anything remotely like a kind of rational mapping of the real entanglements of Europe and the United States is a feature of this crisis. 
And, and within that, then, one has all of the kind of loops that Stephanos was talking about so brilliantly of a kind of fear dimly sensed through a fog, which then aggregates into some gigantic abandonment, um, and, you know, and moves smoothly past the fact that without the Fed, the entire European banking system would have come down in 2008. So there's a, there's a sort of, there seems to be a kind of structural inability almost to develop a coherent and in any way remotely complete account of this relationship. Mm -hmm. So, and I would see this as part of that puzzle. The, a, the blindness to agency and then the difficulty of assigning agency uh, uh, who, who are the actors in each case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a few qu comments here. <clears throat> I don't know if it was just me, but I just detected a difference of approach. I, I detected a difference of approach in the panelists who were lawyers and who practiced in the area and the theoreticians. And the, with the lawyers being maybe not uh, Pollyannish, but certainly having some uh, hope that issues could be addressed. And the theoreticians or the people who looked at the deep reasons for this being completely, I think it's fair to say they were completely pessimistic about doing anything short of maybe, you know, changing the entire structure of the EU or overthrowing capitalism or whatever. Um, and I was just wondering whether people might comment on whether they think there's anything to that, whether it's just a difference in professional approach, um, and also for the people who were so absolutely pessimistic um, and had the deep kind of theory analysis, um, do they see that as leading to any short-term solutions here? Because these refugees do not have the time to wait for the EU to be reconfigured and to wait for capitalism to be changed into some other system. They have an immediate problem right now, and I'm wondering whether their analysis uh, would lead to any um, concrete um, suggestions on how to address the immediate problem. Okay, great. Um, Stathis, that may, be, that, that may be your question, huh? Or, <laughs> why don't you uh, give us a hand here? <laughs> I, I would not make obviously this this, uh, this stark difference differentiation between uh, approaches. I think that, uh, regardless, I mean, I think that we're having a conversation. But in any case, uh, it's not really about uh, a very a very quick answer. Is I just looked at my, just read it just uh, you know five minutes ago. Frontex uh, has already uh, decided on Monday morning two ships of uh, you know Turkish flag, Turkish interest in terms of you know ownership of ships will be taking 750 people from the island of Lesbos back. It's already decided. It's happening on Monday. It's not, it's, it's, it's not can they wait, our, 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 can they wait for you know, the European Union to be fixed or capitalism to be, to be changed. They are getting sent back. That's, that, that's just happening. So, so we still have to deal with the problem. I mean, it's not... It's not um, you know, and dealing with the problem may have certain uh, closer, sort of more proximate, practical uh, possibilities. Alex was right to challenge us. Are there, you know, these things maybe could be taken to the courts. There could be issues of rights that are discussed. Or there could be uh, issues of you know, sort of political decision at a high level. But I don't see much interest in that happening. And my response to that is, my diagnostic response, okay, is that political leaders in Europe right now are, in essence, bound by a structure that you know, depoliticizes them. It, 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 it removes their capacities. And statecraft, which is very, very important in, in history, is terribly weakened. And that's a fact. And that, need, that needs to be changed. In order for this to be changed, something about the European Union configuration has to change. I don't know how that's going to happen. But I don't see how it cannot change. If Europe, the European Union configuration continues the way it is, there will be greater and greater disempowerment, greater and greater violence. And I'm saying, it's not a pessimistic thing. I wonder if I'm not being pessimistic. This is just true. Mm -hmm. Stefanos wants to jump in. And then Daniel, and then we'll go back to the question over here. No, in, in agreeing with, with what Stathis just said, I wanted to add something onto your question about race and religion, which is, you're, 
You're entirely right as to its centrality. And part of the difficulty somehow is that it's not entirely clear what... I think we're all kind of dodging it in part because it's very difficult to figure out what one would say. One narrative would go back into decolonization and into the uh, broad and huge problems of, uh, of secularism and laicite in France especially, which has been the sort of uh, key case. But somehow that doesn't seem to be the only player uh, at all. And in, in a way it seems to be the wrong, I think, the wrong way to go about it. That is to say, it seems to me that uh, efforts at migration or fleeing from Africa are much more intensely placed within, a, within the race and religion uh, bracket. From Syria, it's not always clear. You do have these scenarios of the, you know, you do have somebody every other week who comes out and says, take the Christians or something, but this is not something that's being either taken seriously within the, 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 the actual efforts to, to work with refugees, nor does it seem to be that absolutely central. It doesn't seem to... I'm not, a, I'm not painting a happy picture. I'm just, not, I'm just suggesting that somehow it's not entirely clear that we can find a form of agency. We also can't find a form of agency there, I think, if we assumed... Um, given the, 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 the flow of population from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on, that if we didn't have a Schengen-type scenario, things would be that different. That is to say, I think that there are on different reasons and on an evasion of race and religion that, that things are picked up. And I'm very happy to be corrected uh, one way or another. It just seems to me that this moral economy of empathy, like who is it that one picks? Who is it that... Um, how is it that Palestinians have dropped dramatically in the, you know, let's say in the, in the priorities of a moral economy of empathy in Europe in the last while? Why is it that Syrians as opposed to, you know, the, 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 the countries of the Sahel or the, 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 let's say, Mali very easily are being seen? I think in that broad geographic distinction, something's doable, but I also think that it's somehow an awkward question because it doesn't entirely fit within... A, uh, an easy scenario on that question of what economies of hospitality come in are not easy to negotiate. Taking into consideration history between the European, European history, and the Muslim history, the Muslim history, Christian versus Muslim, Islam, this to me seems to be very important. Maybe this is something we should really look at deeply. Even though, even though it's not been verbalized, Maybe it's rested deeply in the unconscious. But this is something I think we really should not take it lightly. Because well, that's the one thing you have in common. Grace, maybe you fell out of the back, but maybe grace. But Islam, that's one of the religion, is something they all have in common. So I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. I guess the one little thing that I would add into it mm -hmm. is that, in a way, this could have been a crisis put to good use in the that is to say, around the language of hospitality, around some sort of language of the from somewhere, and precisely once the exacerbation has set of it in a manner that was, it's not as if things would have, it's not as if, if Europe had somehow accepted a lot more refugees much faster and, much, and with much more care to their suffering, things would have been better, but it's certainly not been a successful uh, treatment of what is the existing also domestic. Okay, so we're going to do this. Uh, Daniel's going to talk next. Then I have a gentleman in the back who's uh, got his, a question, and then I've got th uh, four Dana, last comments. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's it. Yes, uh, Daniel. Well, uh, I just want to speak briefly to the lawyer as optimist problem, <laughs> which, is, again, is something that's so bizarre to be accused of that because I've spent my whole life fighting the, the man on all this stuff. But I do think that there are two, two things come to mind out of this conversation. I think they're important you know, when we have these kind of cross-disciplinary conversations. One is I think lawyering and law professoring and legal scholarship tends to be more pragmatic and perhaps more you know, situationally focused. And so, uh, sorry? Well, I'm going to get to that. That's the second thing. Um, but so when, when you talk about this tragic uh, Frontex thing coming on, I also have to think at the same time as those people are being removed, which is a tragedy, there are hundreds of thousands of people in Europe who are going to have their cases adjudicated 
against powerful background norms of the rule of law. That's not a trivial accomplishment. It's a historically incredible accomplishment. And I just think it should be named and remembered and not you know, thrown out with the bathwater in the critique, even though you know, in many ways it's superstructural. There's all kinds of things you could say about it. The second thing, without saying about normative, human rights lawyers in particular, and myself most particularly, have to believe and do believe in the evolution of normative discourse and its ultimate crystallization into power. That's, that's what our enterprise is all about. So that is fundamentally an optimistic take on the evolution of the rule of law. But I think it's done pretty well in Europe, certainly by comparison with what's going on in this godforsaken country. OK, thank you. So in the back, over there. It's a real Habermas in there. <laughs> Uh, so since I'm definitely way too young to have any power in Congress or in the EU, uh, what type of direct action can someone that's a student that can't really get to Europe and help, what could you do to help? Right, okay. Uh, so, uh, so now let's have uh, final comments by people who have had their hand up. Okay. And uh, we'll start in the back over there, and then Patrick, and then we'll move over here, okay? Yes, two, three. Yes, I'll ask a question, assuming that it hasn't already been asked, and unfortunately I wasn't here earlier to be able to know where there has been. But uh, I think that to look at any question regarding the policies of the European Union, you also have to include the policies of its uh, evil twin, NATO, and of course, the refugee crisis, if it's not painted as being a form of a blowback for the expansion of the French in North Africa in the last 10 years, they've basically re reconstructed their empire in a kind of virtual way, or the policies specifically in Libya that eliminated millions of jobs, or the attempt to overthrow the Assad government in Syria, one really is not addressing the issue. So the question here of, of dealing with the refugees and, and humanitarian crisis is to address this underlying political economic program that is causing the crisis to begin with. That's my first question. My second question is, it's not so much a question of returning the refugees to their homes, because in the end, people want to be in their own country. They want their country to be peaceful. It's a question of, in this, this, this trade with the Argoyan government in, in Turkey, which is very odorous, is any, any contention being aimed, given to to having camps on the borderline of Syria, where, where, which would somehow be created with the intention of in foresight of the return of these people to their country in the near future? There are such camps. But how, how, how prominent do they figure in the calculus? It seems like it's an eventual thing that isn't really being looked at in terms of a greater policy of looking for peace in that country. Okay, so let's uh, pass it to Patrick, and then we'll come up. And, and we, at this late hour, we can get rid of the pretense of asking questions and just make them comments, okay? <laughs> and but then, brief uh, ones. But brief, brief comments. No, um, just, then, just one comment about the fact that everywhere in every Europe, and it has been mentioned, society and state, there is a struggle. It's not France doing that and Germany. It is everywhere a struggle. And it's, for example, on the status of Muslim, you have people fighting for equal, equal treatment, universal, and all those things. Uh, uh, other like Valls going to Munich saying uh, we sh Germany should not have uh, uh, taken this uh, Syrian, which means which meant probably Muslims. And everywhere there is this struggle. And I think that's, it, it cannot be reported in New York Times because it's too, it's too detailed, but it is very important to follow that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the fact that, for example, in France we were able to resist an, a, a constitutional amendment backed by Sarkozy and the president uh, as to put in the constitution a, something which have targeted the dual citizen which would have meant the African French, of course, North African. That is a, a victory. And, and so you have all these things going on and, and with the help of uh, academic across, the, United, uh, across uh, the Atlantic, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, over here. Yeah. 
Um, just in terms of the issue of the UN role, um, one immediate uh, thing that led to the refugee crisis was the cutting of um, food aid from World Food Program and WH, uh, UNHCR in Lebanon and Jordan. People were going to Lebanon and Jordan. They were not going across to Europe at the time. Um, they cut it down to $13.50 per month per family in Lebanon, and they completely cut it in Jordan. So, you know, one of the things that sort of immediately triggered this was that, and it's the EU and US aid which fund these programs. So I think re-strengthening the UN role in all its agencies is one solution for the crisis, including bringing the peacemaking in Syria back to the Security Council, which is where it eventually now is, and where a ceasefire agreement has finally been agreed with an EU role as well. Um, so I think that's, and, and that means that those like the Saudis and others who wanted Assad to be removed are going to have to swallow some form of his government um, to be able to bring back some stability. Okay, three final last quick comments. One, two, three, no, two. So the two. point I would like to raise um, relates back to the question how perspective um, might have a certain disconnect or the optimistic lawyer. So, um, there, there's certainly no reason for overly, being overly optimistic, but I think uh, I find the figure of the refugee fascinating in the way that it, from the very start of a territorial order, constitutes an exception. So, um, but by having this idea that there, are, under some circumstances, is no unilateral sovereignty to close borders, I think it creates a concept we can work with. So, there would maybe be the point to say pushing uh, for legal rights and to enlarge the uh, definition of the refugee or who, who's, co who's considered a refugee, who's uh, recognized as a refugee, is not so much in opposition to larger theoretical critiques of the system as it stands. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And one last comment? Just sort of um, to add pessimistic comments. Uh, I think some some of the problems are because people are focusing on whatever they could think of to pass blame along. Uh, I've spoken to people in this country who I would assume had been liberal, middle class, educated people who suddenly are so anti-immigrant that I'm shocked. And so I think part of that is the economy's bad, education is bad, this is bad, and this was before Trump, so I can't blame it all on him. Uh, you know, so people are focusing on that. Mm -hmm. And Erdogan didn't have the happy journey he thought he was going to have, the easy thing. So again, taking people's concentration away from things that might be bothering them and focusing it on deporting <laughs> refugees Right. These are wonderful excuses to not focus on what you should be focusing on. Right. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Professor Sheila, Bib Sh Sheila Ben Habib, maybe um, you can give us some concluding thoughts. Um, there's uh, uh, so much that's so uh, good and so important. I think I want to gather my reflections around two, uh, two themes and. Uh, I know Adam has to run, but uh, the second is addressed uh, uh, to you. First, just some comments about the concept of uh, crisis and critical theory, and what kind of critical theory. I mean, the term crisis um, is a, a, a term that signifies in, old, um, in ancient Greek a turning point. It's a term of medical terminology when we say the patient is in critical condition. It always signifies a, a moment when there is a transformation uh, of momentum, maybe towards a decline, maybe towards a transition to another, to another uh, a period. So at least the way in which the old critical theory tradition of the Frankfurt School used it was always in terms of um, the reference to a point of crisis when society would somehow have the capacity to transform itself or gain consciousness toward transformation. Now, if I may introduce a, a set of distinctions that were made by Habermas in the legitimation crisis, they are not unhelpful here. 
Um, uh, when we talk about economic crisis, I think we can talk about dysfunctionalities. And part of what Adam was saying, we are facing an economic uh, crisis in Europe of tremendous proportions, 25% across the board, unemployment, you said, uh, deflation, lack of growth. Uh, in Germany, they have a term for those who have been kicked, I mean, who have no hope of re-entering the labor market. Instead of the proletariat, they talk about the precariat or these transitory jobs and so on. For us, this may not be any news because the American capital labor market is much more disorganized, disaggregated, and so on. But for post-World War social democracy that has built itself upon the idea of a secure uh, wage that results from some kind of training, vocational, educational, this is quite significant and it is rattling. It is rattling the social welfare state uh, compromise within Europe. Certainly that is one set of the, uh, that is a, an important a way in which maybe we can think of a crisis. The second is that I think what's happening right now is an administrative crisis. This is basically a crisis at some level of management, which is where the law comes in, because uh, markets and polities interact, but they play by different rules. And polities, you know, play by the rules or don't play by the rules, but feel themselves constrained by international law. I mean, or you have to be a super sovereign like the United States to say, we define our own rules. <laughs> a lot of this does not apply, apply to us. We could go on and on about you know, the last 20 years of the US uh, Supreme Court and its sovereignist uh, turn. But clearly what we have in Europe is also a profound failure of bureaucratic and administrative uh, imagination and know-how and maybe this punting as that is, as you were saying, is an indicative of the deeper crisis of political, political legitimacy, that there is no European demos, right? And what has happened right now is historically, uh, the Visegrad states, Austria and the Balkan states, all of a sudden said goodbye, we close Sch the Schengen borders. Well, okay, I mean, this is only symbolic. Uh, I, I mean, at the level of the constitutional structure of this building, there are so many things that I am not understanding. The ad hocisms, the incompetence, the lack of quick reaction. So in that sense, it is a very, very deep crisis. But crisis in its true sense always is a crisis of legitimacy and identity. And the question is, are we in the legitimation crisis moment that Havermann talked about in the 1970s, that we go from the economic dysfunctionality administrative crisis to a real crisis of identity within the European Union. And I think the Muslim question, the question of Islam, much less than the question of Africa and race, is becoming the burning, the burning point. There is great fear about Islamism Europas. Look at the two movements in Germany. Pegida and AfD, right? These are huge movements now. This is not true all across Europe. I did not encounter an Arab problem or an Islam problem in Greece. There is the Turkish problem. But even there, people laugh and say we are more like each other than we are not, which we may not have been able to hear 30 years ago. But and Italy and Spain are not on the same wavelength at all. So what I see as emerging is also a split in Europe between North and South, maybe Protestant and Catholic, with the UK having its own policy of multiculturalism, neocolonialism. Look, they navigate the scarf problem with great finesse. With great finesse, you know, the, the, the French are, you know, sort of uh, puzzled up. So uh, I think that at its deepest level, the, there is this identity question. And every time you mention Europe's aging population, and some people say, well, we need to be able to support the welfare state with the remittances of the new working class, I hear an elderly European saying, but this is the end of us. I think that's what's happening in Hungary, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, the small and Austria. Austria has nine to 10% foreign born migrants. The Austria would collapse tomorrow if you know, the migrants would leave Austria, but can they face up to the fact? No, 
France is not that high, it's 5 to 6 percent. Germany is about 9 to 10 percent. But if you look at Eurostat, and I was truly shocked about this, Germany has a negative growth rate. Just please go to Eurostat, WW population, population rate. And if it, I'm sorry, if it weren't, if it weren't for the incoming migrants, Germany's population would sink. Now, this is a very, uh, this is like a, 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 one of these uh, Swiftian considerations. It's like, uh, it's, a, it's an ugly consideration to raise that the right of refugees becomes a question of demographic politics. And if you're interested in this, there is a marvelous exchange between Costas Duzinas and Etienne Balibar, just in open democracy, where Costas raises this question uh, of the sort of the demographics and political economy, and Balibar says, in a Kantian way, no, no, you cannot mix, mix these two up. I agree with Balibar, but nonetheless, we don't have to be fools. We have to see, we have to see that it isn't just morals and principles, but it's also maybe something that Tocqueville said, self-interest properly understood. Some nations and countries in Europe are more open both culturally, like you know, Italy and Spain, Spain in particular, or Greece, but there is the demographic you know, and the labor market considerations that I am sure are driving, are driving the German uh, uh, government. Now, does this mean that, the, I mean, is this so dirty that one should not be even bringing it up, mentioning it? I mean, look at us. 10 million undocumented workers, look at New York. How many undocumented people do we employ as nannies, as our housekeepers, as whatever? What makes the city run? Do we know? Do we ask? No, we don't. Right? So there are many, there are many, polities and markets interact in difficult ways and in complex ways, and I think that um, there is a lot of reform at the level. This refugee question seems to be it is amenable to reform. I would like to rattle up this distinction between the economic and the political migrant. Uh, I would like to take up you know, your suggestions about the rights of the deported people. Uh, ITAN's suggestions about uh, death in the high seas or what Saskia Sassen was saying about the extension of deterritorialized jurisdiction uh, in the airports and in the, in the high seas. There is a lot of conceptual work that we can do, and some of the work that we can do is maybe reformist work, which does not mean that it is the entirety of critical theory, but I guess I've never quite seen these as mutually ex exclusive. And final point to the young a student who asked what can be done. Um, I was very impressed, actually, by... Um, a, an attitude that I was told about in Greece, which is not hospitality only, but philozenia, philozenos, the love of the stranger. There's a lot of work to do on the islands. Uh, if you want to have a good summer vacation, if you can find some money from some institution or European Council or whatever, go and do a four to six week internship on one of the Greek islands where there will still be refugees that are going to be deported and so on. You know, I was thinking of trying to do something like this via our human rights program for our students, but it's a little late. There is, it's, it's enormous to have this existential experience as well, and there's quite a bit, quite a bit uh, to be done with your skills and your competence uh, and so on. At the most, you bear witness, and that's not nothing. So I'd like to thank uh, Sheila Benabib for spearheading this day, uh, all of our panelists. I want to thank Shani Peer and Joella Jones and Claudia Gallus at the Maison Française. There are a lot of people who put this all together. Uh, at, the, at the center, Claire Merrill, Alice Wang, François Carrel and Tess Dreham at the European Institute, Lauren Wolf and Nour Batayenne at the Columbia Global Centers Paris, John and the team at Total Webcasting for all the work on the live streaming and everyone else uh, <coughs> who has made this possible. Thank you very much for coming and thanks for the conversation.